So it was a really vibey evening. I'm there. I'm at the University of Manchester Palestine Solidarity Camp, and you know, I'm just I'm just hanging out with the comrades, and I'm talking about I'm talking about a subject that's close to all of our hearts, uh, the debate, uh, and you know about how it's a waste of time to debate people who are conservatives. It's a waste of time to debate people who are very set in their ways uh, because you know they're already super super invested in their ideology. Um, and really the only kind of useful debates to happen are between leftists about how the revolution should really be done. And as if by magic, as if by <laughs> magic, a stinky, smelly man materialized. As if you'd said the name of a demon. Literally <laughs> materialized next to me and started going, why wouldn't you engage in discussion with people who disagree with you? Surely the echo chamber, blah, blah, blah. And, and I was like, I am losing the my genie mind. of debate. Uh, yeah, I was losing my mind. It's this, this person that appeared to debate me about me not wanting to debate people. Um, and he actually like managed to drag me into this debate because it was a little bit late. I'd had, you know, a pint of Guinness and, uh, you know, I was feeling a little, you know, I was feeling amicable, I guess. Uh, and it was around, I don't know, 15 minutes into this conversation where I realized that like all of my comrades had kind of like disappeared and it was just me and this guy left. Uh, and he was talking to me about how like, you know, communism has never worked and all this stuff. And I'm getting like more and more, more and more stressed about the fact that he's just like not listening to me when I realized that this is like quite possibly like the most negative pussy scenario to ever be in. Like there's nothing, there, there is nothing that is like less attractive than just like two guys endlessly fucking talking about something that just has no, like it's just got no bearing on any, like no one fucking cares. Like everyone just wants to hang out and chill out and have a good, like it was just, there was no riz, a severe lack of riz. Uh, and this guy, by the way, he looked exactly how you're picturing him in your mind. Like he looked exactly like that. I don't even need to describe it because he, he looks exactly like that, you know, it's crazy Horrible. that that would happen with just like a normal guy at the Palestine camp, though. Like, a, like I'm assuming this guy, guy was a normal uh, member of the camp who was just milling around, having a nice time with everyone. Is having that... a nice time. No That's what worries. I thought. Yeah. That's what I mm -hmm. thought, Sophie, until uh, one of the comrades came up to me and said, Yo, mm -hmm. Mule, we've got to go. We need to talk about something important. And I was like, <laughs> oh, shit. OK, dude. And I thought it was something really important. Like we had to like, you know, uh, the, like the cops were coming or something. And and this 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 comrade was like, yeah, that guy's a Zionist. He comes here every night and tries to debate people. Um, and I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> there we go. There's the kicker. That's why oh. there was no riz. That's why yep. he had no riz. Negative he, um, riz. Negative riz. Baby Gronk <laughs> would not be impressed. Um, <laughs> nothing going on there at all. <laughs> That's fucking right. That's that's how we talk now on Red Planet. We <laughs> and we're all about the Riz and uh, to to get the Riz rolling in. Tim, what was the other thing you said, uh, Tim? Baby Gronk. Yeah, Baby Gronk. He would <laughs> not right. be impressed. Mm. All right, absolute uh, uh, negative displays of Riz. All right, uh, Skibbity Baby Riz. Tim, can you tell me what the most base thing you did this week was? Um, so it's actually been, uh, it's been a couple weeks. It's been, uh, since, since I last graced your screens and ears, um, there's been a lot of stuff going on down, um, here in Aotearoa. Um, gonna get into that, into the news sections in just a minute. Um, after we do this, I'll get a little bit deeper into it. But there have been some series of protests that have been happening here. Um, there have been like four, maybe three, three big ones over the last like two weeks, um, which has been like, and they've been like big ones, like huge. Um, New Zealand is obviously a lot smaller than, you know, the UK. Well, I mean, it has a smaller population than like the UK and all that kind of stuff. Um, so generally at like a, a good protest might have, a, you know, like a couple thousand people turn out. That would be like a really, really big success. But some of the ones over the last, yeah, just like the last two weeks or so have been like, like there was a climate protest that we had just in uh, Auckland Central just the other day that there was probably like 20,000 people there. Um 
there was there have been a couple um focused on maori issues and things like that that have been like thousands and thousands but also like all over the country in every different city even in small towns like you know like these like synchronized protests where it's like each one has had like a huge presence you know like even in small towns getting like like a, a town of like a couple hundred people getting like a couple dozen people out or like a small city that might only have like you know a million people or something like that living there and then having like you know like hundreds to you know thousands of people showing up is huge is gigantic um uh, I'll get into the reasons for the protests a little bit later in the in the news but yeah it's kind of like um uh there's been a general air of discontent with the current coalition government so we've been um just yeah just getting out and and showing our discontent <laughs> showing it in the streets uh and mass they've been largely um pretty pretty chill vibes like you know the government is like and they're kind of cheerleaders have set everyone up to expect like violent revolution and all this kind of stuff and it's like buddy i wish <laughs> um but yeah no they've been really chill vibes um really good really positive um lots of good speakers and stuff and i feel like they've been doing that good thing where they've been appealing to a huge audience to draw people in and then actually at those events radicalizing them further which i think is um what a good a good rally a good protest uh, often does but um yeah so just um like uh attending those where i can uh like even <laughs> going to one and then like running to work to do tattoo appointments afterwards uh which i've done before is um, nice is great but um yeah, so it's been pretty busy down here. What about uh, Mule? What have you been doing? Thank you very much, Tim. Um, I have been doing a bunch of stuff. Uh, the thing that sticks out the most, though, is uh, we I we currently have a member who is uh, embroiled in a, a dispute with her landlord. I think I've mentioned her before on the show. We represented her in court. I think that this, this was something that I said like the last time we were live on the last show. Um and uh yeah she's she's basically like I, I you know wanting to pursue a proper campaign to try and force uh this uh this uh this landlord to come to the table and negotiate with us and part of that is we are doing a uh, a video sort of comms piece we're going to do a social media campaign to try and like you know basically sh showcase how bad this letting agent is this letting agent landlord sort of uh sort of uh combination business um and just kind of like how their bad practices affect people on the ground um and so yeah i went down to her house and filmed a bunch of stuff like filmed a bunch of the disrepair filmed a bunch of the uh you know terrible electrics like honestly like it's you know it's one of those things when you when you <clears throat> i've been to i've been to houses before where you know, you go, you go to a place like, for example, we have a branch in Middleton, which is like a very deprived area in Manchester. And you go there and you speak to some of the people there. And then they say, this is really bad. Look at my house. And you go there and you're like, yes, it's completely, I understand it. But sometimes you like with this one member, I was speaking to her a lot over the phone. Um, and it was kind of like, you know, you don't quite picture it until you, you go down there. And, and you, sometimes you think you've seen it all when you're doing housing activism uh but like i went i went down there and it was just so bizarre here's here's one thing anecdotally that happened you'll just have to take my word for it but i was setting up all all of my recording equipment like uh so i have like a, a portable zoom recorder for the audio uh, i plugged that into the into the wall socket and then after about 20 minutes it died and that was because the electrics just do not work properly in the house and it's like she you know she was there and she was like yeah it, it just does that it just does that. And it's like, cool. Yeah. You've been here for like three years and you know, with your son, you're a single mom, like, cool. Yeah. It's, it's cool that you have to deal with that. Um, so yeah, but like amongst like a, a bunch of other stuff, just like, if I could show to you this, I mean, it will be able to show it to you because I'm going to showcase this person in my next, in my upcoming YouTube video anyway. Uh, but like all of the, all of the, 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 the electrics meters like on, on a board, 
in in the hall, just like on a bit of plywood ball board, like all exposed, like you know, no like individual thing to sort of like keep them separate from each other. And th- th- there was just like a light switch that just doesn't work, and oh, just nonsense, just just all kinds of like horrible stuff. Like the entire house was freezing. Uh, apart from one room, one room was really hot. Anyway, loads of really really bad stuff. But I filmed a bunch of it. We did an interview, and we're going to be using that for some uh, you know some nice. Uh, Nice little bit of social media pressure for this uh, horrific landlord letting agents. That'll be nice. Sophie, what about you? Well, that's um, just this, this. I mean, it's like every time I think about the conditions of, of of renters who are going through like stuff in 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 renters unions, it's a fucking nightmare. And then I just mm-hmm. think about the issues I've had in my own place, and I'm like, oh yeah, this is just this is just landlords in general. This is just it. Right. Uh, what about me? Right. Um, yeah, it's been uh, like Tim said, it's been a few weeks. So what what has been going on? Um, I uh, helped a friend out who uh, broke her ankle. Um, we were going climbing together, and she slipped off the starting hold of a bouldering route which i am told by the climbing uh, uh center staff is the most common way that people hurt themselves because you don't have time to react uh but it doesn't make it less funny um <laughs> sincere apologies i know she's watching right now um <laughs> but i helped her out uh getting to the hospital and then going for a second scan and stuff like that and reminder that being a good friend is a based thing to do even if it's not the literal revolution um but you know more on more on um you know political stuff i uh have been finally getting around to reading some bell hooks has been on my like vaguely must read some bell hooks reading list for a uh, um for a long time and i'm hyped about that um and um i met some people from a cool org which i can't really talk about now but i think that uh to get the scale of it being based it's like an org that I've been trying to network with for several years in London who do really cool stuff that's quite high profile and have finally met some people from there and will maybe get someone from them on the show at some point. I don't know. Um, and I, <laughs> I'm not going to say more right now, but that's that's the that's the base stuff I've been up to. So, yeah. Um, but if you view a listener... Uh, have been up to based stuff we want to know about it so please tell us what what based things you've been doing you can message us on twitter instagram or tiktok uh or send an email to based at redplanetshow.com include your name and pronouns if you want and uh we might shout it out in a later episode right here we'd be saying wow look at this really based thing that someone did um but tim you wanted to tell us a lot more about your based thing and it's actually our first news story so please the floor is yours. I'm hyped for this one. Take yeah, I actually kept, um, like, when I was talking about, you know, just earlier, my most base thing, I was like, just keep going to say more. And then I was like, no, I just can't. I have to wait for the news. Like, but no, it's been, um, it's been pretty, pretty hectic down here. Um, so, yeah. So the coalition government, which is, uh, yeah, coalition between the National Act and NZ First parties that are in power down here in New Zealand, Aotearoa at the moment. That's um, national is like the kind of boring, like generic mainstream right party. NZ First is like the boomer populist, um, very like right wing nationalist party. And then uh act is like the libertarian party so we well they're like the fake libertarian party like they say they're libertarian but they're really just kind of right-wing populist and they yeah they're they're all about deregulating just anything to do with like um you know like extractive industries or like just anything they can make the money but then they also do have like a lot of pro-regulation things when it comes to like you know making sure that like schools can't talk about like like you know like uh like sexual education and things like that or like just like you know typical stuff so those are the that's the unholy trinity that we have in power at the moment and ever since they got in they've just been firing off policy after policy that uh like deliberately undoing like literally over a hundred years of policy to help help maori 
to, and but not just help Maori, but to um, to fulfill their legal obligations as a government that is that signed a treaty, you know, to to be here, to to have a country here, and all this kind of stuff. Um, so you know, long story short, we signed a treaty that hasn't been honored, um, and time after time courts have found that the government is at fault and it needs to do these things it needs to do those things we have like a special court system for it it's like our entire legal system kind of is intertwined with all of this kind of stuff and so this government has got in and basically just started trying to unpick as much of that as possible um which is like pretty pretty horrific because it's really only over the last i would say like 10 or 20 years where things have started to get to a point where you know like um almost like a similar baseline kind of level of equity i would say for um for maori and pakia so it's like really frustrating to be like so close you know, like um, even with the Waitangi Tribunal for historic land claims and all that kind of stuff, like it's almost all entirely wrapped up. But it is the the last cases that they're still working on, like um, like the Napui settlement, which is for my own tribe, is like is huge because it's one of the bigger one of the bigger tribes, and they're you know, like it means that there will be significant kind of like redress to Napui from the government. And I feel like they're trying to get in to stop a lot of this stuff before it happens, because it would mean like, it means a lot of stuff for like land rights and all that kind of stuff. And they're just trying to unpick all this stuff as soon as they can, as well as, um, you know, just things like, just like little petty things, like taking Maori language off of like, a lot of like um like public signage or like government agencies and all this kind of stuff and i'm like i've always been very critical of government agencies using maori names and things like that because i kind of feel like you know like when um child youth and family services became oranga tamariki they were still stealing maori children from you know, their homes and doing things like that. Like, it's just like a kind of, you know, it's like that kind of um, like whitewashing or, you know, woke washing or whatever like that. So, um, you know, like I was always critical of that stuff anyway, but then as soon as this government comes in and they start doing this stuff very targeted, it's kind of like, okay, well, I don't see any other way to perceive this other than like deliberate attacks on Maori, you know? with the amount of stuff plus they've got um uh there's like a fast track approvals bill that they're bringing in which means that there's like three government ministers from the the current government that have like the they basically get to say whether or not uh like certain projects get approved with no real oversight from experts or whatever and it's all like extractive industries it's all like mining it's all you know like deep sea oil drilling and all this kind of stuff in areas where there's like protective species and all this kind of stuff so it's just like this you know this huge overwhelming assault on on everything that we kind of uh try to protect and so um yeah so in response obviously people have been upset about that and um so te Pati maori which is like the the a political party that uh like you know like there's there's a distinct difference between like maori people maori and politics and then te Pati maori which are like they're called the maori party but they are they're a political party that is just you know comprised of maori that advocate for our interests but they're not you know they don't represent all maori or whatever like that it's not like a sp specific like they don't exist as like um a separate kind of parliament or anything like that but they have pronounced uh, they have um they have announced that they want to look into forming a separate maori parliament like what they have a lot with um indigenous groups like in south america and things like that um, and so that was announced at one of these gigantic protests or kind of that I was talking about earlier in the um, in the little pre-news section and stuff. Thousands of people all 
across like in every different city, every different town in New Zealand all came out and showed up, showed up for these. This is where they announced that they're going to look into it, which is actually um, not a new concept. It's something that has been talked about like ever since the treaty was first signed, you know, um, but people are acting like this is like a very big unprecedented move and that it's going to be like a separatist movement and all this kind of stuff. There's a lot of, a lot of uh, kind of, you know, like a lot of fear mongering about it, but um, it's actually, yeah, it's, I, I don't actually believe it to be a particularly extreme kind of um, concept when you look at the way that a lot of other nations have handled um, having, you know, like um, a regular parliament kind of um, interact with an indigenous nation. It's not, it's not unprecedented and it's not particularly extreme either. But um, yeah, so these, these protests, uh, well, they called them activations, which I think is interesting because the intention of them is to, um, to activate unpoliticized Maori. But also, you know, like a lot of Pakia, a lot of Toiwi, like foreigners and stuff, were also at these events. It was, you know, like they're like huge. Um, and so, yeah, these activations, um, they had local speakers from not just from the Maori party, just all kinds of different leftist speakers. It was like union organizers, all this kind of stuff. One of the original, one of the early criticisms was that they didn't do enough to organize with unions before announcing like, Hey, in a couple time days time, we're going to do these big, like, you know, we're going to do these big protests and we want you all to come. Cause this is like in the middle of the work week, you know, but um, in the end, the unions all kind of came together with a lot of the organizers and it was like, a pretty pretty good turnout there was like no arrests out from any of them whatsoever despite all the you know the baiting and the the fear mongering and stuff which is pretty amazing um yeah it was pretty it was pretty great um so uh the co-leaders of the of Te Pāti Māori at these events that's where they said that they were gonna um they were gonna look into setting up this new Māori parliament but they said that they were going to do it um because we have these things called hui that are like big um, meetings gatherings and stuff like that and there's regular ones all over the place and there was one coming up just in a few days after that protest where a bunch of kind of like tribal leaders and stuff were supposed to be gathering anyway so they said that's what this is going to be about like we're going to go there and we're going to talk about that so then um like two days later um, down uh, at, in Hawke's Bay at the Omahu Marae at the Hui Tomata, they um yeah all these people came together and it wasn't just like tribal leaders um it was also just like Maori intellectuals and you know just like people of note and all this kind of stuff that got together and all had turned to talking about kind of like possible parliament structures what that would look like what kind of um what it would necessitate or even people speaking against the idea as well um or criticizing the idea of a parliament as such and putting forward other structures which is really interesting um one of the one of my favorite um speakers from this event and also from a couple previous ones Annette Sykes who's a lawyer um you know she basically well she said and part of it was like you cannot dismantle the colonizers house with the colonizers tools which is something that we you know like we hear a lot but um yeah she was warning people of emulating the kind of western parliament structure too closely because that hasn't really got us anything in the past and it's like why just create a parallel of that you know like we don't need that we don't need to create a, a mirror of their system but with us at the table you know it's like so um so I thought that was really good um there was yeah there was a lot of other people that had some really interesting things to say especially bringing up examples of other you know other indigenous nations that have done this all around the world how they did it um which was really uh, surprising like I as far as I'm aware, not many people knew that this was going to be what 
you know, like that this was going to be spoken about there. I think a couple people kind of had a had a heads up, but um, yeah, it was really impressive. Some of these talks and some of these suggestions. Um, so yeah, we'll see how that develops. You know, if anything comes out of it or not, um, I would love to see it. But um, I'll I guess I'll I'll stay tuned and I'll keep keep the updates coming as they do. <laughs> but um, in the meantime, Sophie, why don't you tell us what's going on? over there speaking of protests what's happening in the uk at the moment yeah i chose a really good time to put some crisps in my mouth and um <laughs> stop munching them so i'm gonna just um whoa oh, Dad, sophie you're looking um, great today <laughs> thanks babe i really appreciate that tim that was super interesting and like um i have loads to say about it but we're pressed for time i really think we should mm -hmm. like do a full episode on this as things develop because like yes. this is I, I think so really too, fucking yeah. cool yeah, I was Land skipping over a, a lot thing and like yeah. the what you're saying, like I remember you sent me a Net Sykes giving a speech a little while ago and she's fucking cool as hell. Um, but yes, protest in the UK. Let's talk about that. Uh the UK courts find anti-protest legislation to be unlawful. Uh this is a big fucking deal. Um the Tories uh anti-protest legislation uh has been such a heap of shit that even the Met police, one of the worst police forces in the fucking world. Uh, we're like, ah, these police powers seem like a bit much. I'm not sure we're going to use them, actually. Thanks, bro. <laughs> um, and so Liberty, the UK's largest civil liberties organization, released a report two weeks ago regarding the UK High Court ruling surrounding the anti-protest laws that were passed controversially in June 2023. The following are some excerpts from that report. The UK High Court has ruled that the government acted unlawfully in creating legislation which gave the police almost unlimited, that's quote, almost unlimited, end quote, powers to restrict protests. And as I said, the Met, even the fucking Met, fuck the Met, were like, oh, this is too much. Um, in its judgment published 21st of May 2024, the court found that the then Home Secretary Suella Braverman, uh, spitting sound, uh, <laughs> passed anti-protest measures in June 2023 despite having not been given the power by Parliament to do so. In today's ruling, Lord Justice Green and Mr. Justice Kerr said that the government ignored Parliament's will in failing to de uh, define the meaning of, quote, serious disruption, end quote, and instead broadened the definition to the point that police were allowed to intervene in protests where disruption was, it was quote, closer to that which is normal or everyday. Hundreds of protesters have been arrested under these measures since they were created, including the climate activist Greta Thunberg, who was acquitted of all charges in a hearing in February 2024. Uh, Liberty hailed the judgment as a, vict as a, quote, victory for democracy, saying, quote, it sets down an important marker that the government cannot just do what it wants. The court also found that the consultation ran by the government prior to proposing this legislation was, quote, one-sided and not fairly carried out and therefore also unlawful. Liberty said that the ruling shows that the government cannot just cherry pick who they consult in order to get the results they want. And uh, Akiko Hart, Liberty's director, said this. This ruling is a huge victory for democracy and sets down an important marker to show that the government cannot just step outside the law and do whatever it wants. We all have the right to speak out on these issues, the issues we believe in, and it's vital that the government respects that. These dangerous powers were rejected by Parliament, yet still sneaked through the back door with the clear intention of stopping protesters that the government did not personally agree with, and were so va uh, vaguely worded that it meant the police were given almost unlimited powers to shut down any other protest too. This judgment sends a clear message that accountability matters and that those in power must make decisions that respect our rights. And yeah, I think this is this is a huge step for like, the UK and, and people being actually able to fight for what's right in the UK. At the same time, like we have seen people arrested on these powers just be let off by juries over and over and over and over again. So I think that like uh, at the same time that reversing these dangerous police powers is a huge step for like just the basic freedoms of, of UK of people in the UK. Um, I think that it, it's honestly done damage to the credibility of the justice system enormously, uh, which you could arguably say has has some to do with like top cop Keir Starmer uh being on the way in in labor um but anyway maybe the discussion for another time again we are pressed for time so why don't you tell me about the Congo now my beloved Neil why don't I well there's no reason that I shouldn't so I'm going to uh, this story is about lawyers in Congo finding evidence that Apple has been buying smuggled 
minerals. Uh, so most people will know if you have uh, done any kind of research into what's kind of going on geopolitically at the moment, there is a massive humanitarian crisis in Congo, uh, whereby just, you know, people are being forced into slavery. Uh, you know, we're talking every kind of person, women, children, you name it, are all just being forced to essentially mine uh, minerals that are being used in smartphones, tablets, PCs, all that kind of stuff for our imperial core based Western decadence. Um, and so the following story and subsequent information is according to a news report by Reuters. Uh, international lawyers representing the government of the Democratic Republic of Congo said on Wednesday that they had new evidence gathered from whistleblowers, which deepened concerns that Apple could be sourcing minerals from conflict areas in eastern Congo. In a statement, the lawyers urged Apple to answer questions about its supply chain in the country, and they said they were evaluating legal options. Apple did not immediately respond to a Reuters request for comment. Congo's lawyers notified Apple CEO Tim Cook on April 22nd of a series of concerns about its supply chain and also wrote to Apple subsidiaries in France demanding answers within three weeks. The Amsterdam and Partners LLP law firm has been investigating allegations that minerals mined in Congo by several companies and armed groups are being smuggled out through Rwanda, Uganda and Burundi. One of the whistleblowers, Robert Amsterdam, said the firm has since received new evidence from whistleblowers. Apple has said in the past that it does not directly buy, procure, or source primary minerals, and it has been auditing its suppliers for several years and publishing its findings. In a report last year, it said that 100% of identified smelters and refiners in the supply chain for all applicable Apple products manufactured in 2023 had participated in an independent third-party conflict minerals audit for tin, tantalum, and tungsten, known as 3T Minerals and Gold 3TG. Since the letter issued by Congo lawmakers in April, clashes have intensified in eastern Congo, where Rwandan-backed M23 rebels have seized control of Rubaya, a key mining town for coltan used in smartphones and other appliances. And I guess if there's anything that I, I, I think I want the audience uh, to, to sort of take away uh, from this story and like learning about what's going on in Congo, at the very least... Um, it's the, yeah, you know, it, it, what we've been saying on Red Planet for the entire time that we've been doing the show is just completely true. Like, you know, the Imperial core extracts wealth, uh, you know, from, from the Imperial periphery. And that means that everybody in, in our countries has this like super comfortable, uh, individualist consumerist life. Um, and that is why everything needs to fucking change. We need to stop making fucking iPhones. <laughs> like, how many fucking iPhones do we fucking need? How many fucking PCs do we fucking need? You know, there are there are fucking landfills full of the fucks. So I'll stop swearing and I'll pass it over to Tim, who's going to tell us about Deliveroo drivers protesting low wages. Yeah, cool. So, um. Uh, this information that we've got is actually from a report that restaurantonline.com put together. But um, yeah, delivery drivers have staged a protest outside the company's annual general meeting in London. So it's over working conditions described by one writer as a soul destroying. As reported by The Standard, dozens of members of the Brazilian, Bengali, Romanian, and British writer communities arrived for a demonstration outside the offices of White and Case Law Firm in London on Thursday, the 23rd of May, as the AGM took place inside. Protesters allege that Deliveroo has repeatedly failed to engage with them over poor pay and job security as they face growing financial difficulties. However, Deliveroo has claimed that the overwhelming majority of writers working for the company are satisfied. Deliveroo, which signed a union recognition deal with GMB back in 2022, reportedly agreed recently to increase the guaranteed minimum pay for the periods when drivers are on order to £12 an hour plus vehicle costs above the 11.44 hourly rate required. Um, so, uh, however, protester Matthew Town, who has been a delivery driver for more than five years, told the standard that pay will still work out as less than £12 an hour because drivers often take longer to carry out a delivery than delivery estimates due to factors like waiting times at restaurants or traffics. He said, we've seen a steady real-term decrease in pay year on year. 
our labor is being bid on every day to the lowest paying rider to take that order, but you have no choice. It's soul destroying. During the AGM, Deliveroo Chief Executive Will Shu and the board were confronted by driver representatives supported by responsible investment charity Share Action and the Independent Workers Union of Great Britain. Union representatives subsequently said most of the queries put forward were met with bog standard answers. This latest action follows a series of protests protests earlier this year that saw drivers for food delivery platforms, including Deliveroo, Just Eat, and Uber Eats, strike in a dispute over pay. So yeah, so that's an interesting one um, there because it's like the structure of this business has them like the le- workers legitimately like bidding against each other to give so the fucked. customer the, the deal, you know, like that's wild. Like that's literally their business model. Um, yeah. And so, yeah. you know, obviously this, like the, um, you know, it's like that thing where it's like on paper, they can go like, Oh, look, we, you know, we pay above the minimum hourly rate or whatever. But then when it's like, you actually look into it and you really, consider what it meaningfully takes to do the job it's like oh actually no they you know they're getting paid a lot less than that so um yeah hopefully yeah. hopefully uh these delivery drivers can um get a good deal because um i mean we all know those those companies are making money hand over fist ever since the, the pandemic yeah. but uh well i mean before the then even it's pandemic. still like the like gig economy tools to as you were saying yeah. like make workers bid against each other just mm. like they were presented as this huge innovation and the innovation is just like in the ability for bosses to exploit workers even harder. So like, yeah. I think something that's been great to see over the progress of like doing Red Planet for the last few years so far, it's just been like how much we've seen gig economy unions get stronger. And this is like, mm. yeah. yeah, I just Googled uh, Will Shoes salary uh, and it's 674,000 <laughs> pounds a year. Mm. So that's, yeah. That's that's cool, isn't it? That's wow. where that's where that extra money's going, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but um, yeah. Why don't we um? Why don't so? Why don't you tell us what's been happening in the uh, Korean Peninsula? What's, you're laughing um... while you're asking me about it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, sure. Yeah, it's a funny one. So North Korea. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if people know about this, but North Korea dropped garbage on South Korea. Um, <laughs> North Korea has flown hundreds of trash carrying balloons to South Korea again in its third such campaign since late May. The South's military said just days after South Korean activists floated their own balloons to scatter propaganda leaflets over the northern border. Um, So, you know, for the immediate context, like the trash is just them saying you're sending us trash. So we're sending you trash back. Um, A South Korean civilian group led by North Korean defector, Park Sang Hak said it launched 10 balloons on Thursday carrying 200,000 anti North Korean leaflets, USB sticks with K pop songs and K dramas, and $1 bills. <laughs> <laughs> uh, fantastic. Um, say, mm-hmm. say, um, so, uh, North Korea responded to this by flying hundreds of trash carrying balloons to South Korea. Um, and uh, uh, so they've uh, so far have sent more than a thousand balloons to drop tons of trash in uh, the south uh, in retaliation against this uh, this leafleting campaign or, or, or several leafleting campaigns, uh, adding to tensions between the war divided rivals amid a diplomatic stalemate over the north's nuclear ambitions. Uh, in response, South Korea suspended a 2018 tension easing agreement with North Korea. Uh, the move allows the south to restart live fire military exercises and anti north. Korean propaganda loudspeaker broadcast in border areas. Excuse me. Uh, actions that are certain to anger North Korea and prompted to take its own retaliatory military steps, which is great. We love to see that. Um, or maybe they just drop loads more trash. So it'd be funny. Uh, I saw someone saying this is just like incredible hater energy to just be dro- <laughs> just to drop a ton of garbage <laughs> on, on the other country. But um, Saturday's balloon launches by North Korea were the third of their kind since May 28th. Uh, in North Korea's previous two rounds of balloon activities, South Korea, uh, South Korean authorities discovered about a thousand balloons that were tied to vinyl bags containing compost, cigarette butts, scraps of cloth, waste batteries, and waste papers. Some were popped and scattered on roads, residential areas, and schools. <laughs> uh, no highly dangerous 
no highly dangerous materials were found and no major damage has been reported. There was some discussion on social media that was talking about the, the balloons containing poop, which uh, I it would be like technically like chemical warfare uh, yeah. or like biological warfare. So it's worth clarifying that, that did not happen. Yeah, um, yeah. Even uh, South Korea have come out and said that there was like nothing hazardous inside the yeah. inside the bundles at all. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, that's a that's a lighthearted one, um, despite yeah. the possible military tensions. But uh, unfortunately, we got to get around to our Palestine update. Uh, Mule, do you want to tell us what's happening uh, in Palestine? Yeah, sure. So we don't have our uh, normal uh, uh, programmed uh, large, long uh, uh, list of things going on in Palestine, uh, but that's okay. We just have one major update for you this week. Uh, This is about the massacre uh, that took place. uh, I think it was literally last night. Uh, But essentially, Israel has carried out a hostage rescue mission alongside the USA military that has resulted in a total of four hostages being rescued at the cost of over 250 Palestinian civilian deaths, it's being reported. The exact details of the operation are unknown to Red Planet at this time, but it has been suggested that the US military and the IOF used an aid truck to sneak their personnel into a refugee camp, and upon being approached by starving Palestinian refugees, they exited the vehicle firing upon the crowd. Vile shit. It is extremely telling that the IDF had to rely on US military support in order to carry out this mission. Uh, Something like this only happening, being attempted in eight months into the ongoing genocide in Gaza, uh, and has come at a time when US and Israel popularity is at an all time low. So weekly, fuck Israel, uh, fuck the US, uh, you know, what the fuck, free Palestine. Um, yeah, and uh, please, everybody who is listening, please continue to act in solidarity with Palestinians uh, wherever you are, however you can. But it is at this point in the show where we remind you that we are indeed a show and we have a Patreon and it's very good and there's lots of things that you can get by being a patron. We're not going to go through those now. We might not go through them at all this entire show because we're being cheeky at the minute, I guess. Uh, but please go. We're just being real silly billies with it. Uh, can you please go to <laughs> patreon.com forward slash red underscore planet and give us money? It's cool and it's good. It's great and you'll enjoy it. Um, and yes, Red Planet is made possible entirely by the direct support of our audience. So thank you very much. But it is now time for our main segment, our guest segment for this show uh we at red planet are always talking about communism and how it would be really cool if workers came together to unite in some kind of unifying organization that meant that they could use their collective power to seize the means of making the stuff that they make and make the stuff that they want to make and tonight we are pleased to bring you organizers working with campi di bisenzio Ferenzi, italy uh, the gkn factory collective who have occupied their factory to argue the production should move from GKN driveline car axles to cargo bikes and solar panels. We're joined by Sean, uh, who I believe is one of the workers at the factory. And look, no. Okay, let me just rephrase that again. Sure, yeah, we're rolling that back. Sean is not from the factory. <laughs> Sean is is from the I tell you what, I'll let Sean introduce himself in a minute. Um and Sean and Lorenzo are here to talk on behalf of the workers at the factory. Lorenzo, do you want to introduce yourself and tell us how um uh what your relation to the XGKN right. workers is? Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Lorenzo Feltrin, and until recently, I was a postdoc researcher at the University of Birmingham, but also I'm from Italy. So I've been uh, following the XGKN dispute in uh, Florence. Um, the basics of it is that uh, in the summer of 2021, uh, the ban on layoffs that was uh, you know, put by the government during COVID was uh, lifted, uh, and one of the first mass layoffs that we had in Italy was that uh, the financial fund uh, Melrose Industries, which is the owner of uh, GKN, uh, is uh, <clears throat> decided to fire all of the workers of this GKN factory in Florence by email, 
with immediate effect, uh, which is illegal. Cool. In, in, Norm in, normal and cool stuff. That's that's fun for all of the workers, right? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, it's uh, more than 400 workers. Um, so, I mean, there's a long history of uh, factory closing down in Italy, as there is one in the UK. Uh, in fact, in Birmingham, there was a GKM factory that was closed about the same time. Uh, but this story is quite special because they had a different approach. Uh, so normally what happens is that the workers would uh, try to resist by defending their jobs as they are, or more often the, with the unions, they would try to negotiate uh, some better uh, leave benefits uh, and employment benefits and then, you know, just basically take it. Uh, while uh, this factory was special about it is that have had a very militant uh, uh, collective of shop stewards and uh, activist workers. Uh, so they had been studying many other factory closures before them. Uh, they were making axles for cars. So the automotive sector has been undergoing, is undergoing a massive restructuring in Europe in general. Uh, and so they decided to take a more uh, creative approach and uh, they said, nobody asked us, obviously, whether we wanted to produce axle, car axles for uh, mostly luxury cars lately. Uh, so why won't, don't we draw up some sort of green Lucas plan uh, and propose that the production in the factory is converted uh, to <clears throat> making a sustainable public transport, which is what is you know needed for some kind of real uh, conversion. So as somebody who's uh, been studying the sort of jobs environment dilemma as part of my, <clears throat> you know, work, but also uh, also having an interest in always being connected with uh, social movements, I'm part of a social movement organization in the northeast of Italy, uh, I started to follow the dispute. Uh, and the first time I went there was for the celebration of the first year of the takeover. So what happened is that uh, since the first day, uh, the workers took over the factory and it's uh, formally not an occupation, it's rather a permanent sit-in because they're still employed uh, by the company. And they connected to a group of militant researchers from different disciplines. Uh, so you have uh, people in economics, people in uh, history, sociology, but also engineering. And they drafted this plan for conversion. And with this plan, they went to the climate movement uh, in Italy and uh, proposed an alliance to them. And that was unbelievably successful because that's what a lot of people felt, that's what we need. So militant, uh, unionized workers together with climate activists, as opposed to what happens many other times, which is an opposition between the two. So they pulled out some massive demonstrations of tens of thousands of people in Florence and then in Bologna. And uh, I'll leave the narrative here for the minute, but this is basically the main reason why I'm here with you guys. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Lorenzo. And Sean, I believe you've got everything sorted now. Do you want to <laughs> introduce yourself? Hi, let's give it a go. That's much better. Yeah, you're all good to go. Yeah, cool. Um, so... Yeah, so um, I have visited the, the factory in Florence um, last year. Um, so I work in a bicycle cooperative, a workers' cooperative in the UK, and I'm involved in the Worker Cop Federation in the UK. And um, one of the main um, products that they're wanting to produce is cargo bikes. Um, so I went for the launch of their, their kind of prototype first edition cargo bike and to just, just see what was going on, basically. So... Um, since then, since sort of seeing it, I've I've been to quite a few. Um, you know, I've been involved in in co-ops for a while and in sort of worker con management and worker control struggles um, and union struggles, and I've never really seen anything at this scale. So it was really impressive and um, something also that kind of acts as like a. Um, a kind of, I don't know, like a lightning rod or like a central focal point for climate justice um, movements around worker control in, in Europe. So I thought that, um, you know, I would try and try and um, help raise money for them um, for their struggles. So for the strike fund and also for their 
the, the popular shareholding fund um, that they that they're running, um, which will help sort of capitalize the purchase of the the factory, which is uh, going to be super expensive, but but also um, you know it's quite an inspiring it's an inspiring project. So that's sort of where how I uh, approach the, the GKN basically. Fantastic, and we're hopefully going to be joined by Dario at ten, and Dario is. Uh, one of the workers who is currently taking part in the in the action. But let's talk a little bit to you two uh, just kind of about like, because, you know, Lorenzo, you really went into the history of like, you know, what happened and it was uh, 2021, wasn't it? Um, and they, you know, essentially had this email come through, right, that's it, game over. Uh, and every single person at this factory, well, maybe not every single person, but a, a super majority at least, uh, I imagine, uh, has, has turned around and gone, yeah, let's uh, let's let's not be unemployed. Let's uh, let's uh, you know change what we're what we're making and uh, and and be part of the climate justice movement. It's absolutely fascinating. So, I wonder if you could tell us like a little bit about. Um, what you know of the the process and like did it start with with unionization did it start with uh, unionized workers or a, a vote to unionize or was it more of a, a sort of a, a wildcat movement that just grew and grew and grew and then this is kind of the 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 result um well yeah it was uh it started from the workers uh so uh what happened is that um at the time that uh, the factory occupation started, well, the factory sit-in started, uh, the climate movement was still big in Italy, and uh, there was the G20 uh, for um, on climate justice, uh, well, climate justice on the climate on the climate in Milan. In that was in uh, early October 2021, and that's when the factory collective uh, visited the climate camp in Milan and uh, started to talk to environmental activists and organizations about this idea. Uh, so, so that's where uh, the initiative came from. Uh, and then obviously there is this sort of, um, you know, broad network now in which everybody has different roles. So obviously the people in the university is more about writing and producing plans and crunching numbers, uh, while uh, the workers are mainly in the factory because they have to defend it basically and you will hear from Dario uh, and uh, and then there is uh, different uh, social movement organizations uh, both from climate justice side of things and the labor side of things uh, so you have the big uh, trade unions you have the more radical smaller trade unions uh, you have the social centers and uh, you have Fridays for Future and mainly Fridays for Future but also Extinction Rebellion uh, so that's basically this broad composition out there. Perfect um and yeah i guess i guess what i was trying to ask there was like you know were the were the workers basically already unionized when they decided to occupy the factory yeah 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 so just to, there there was like a that they are part of i think CG, cgla um cgil um union which is one of the large kind of like main established unions because it's obviously like a heavy a heavy industry so they already had a, a base of unionization, but what they did um, and have been doing for some years, which I'm sure Dario will tell you about um, when he arrives, is building like a kind of shop steward network that was then, when this news came out, they're in a position to, um, you know, act outside of the established union um, way of doing things. And you know, I think Lorenzo mentioned that there was a there was a factory in Birmingham in the UK um as well that was part of the same um same company GKN which it actually originated in the UK but obviously now it's a, a big multinational um corporation and and those guys they were with Unite and they they basically just ended up taking the redundancy package because this kind of being able to do the, the, what the what they did in GKN in in Florence requires like a, a real level of sort of coordination and, and bravery sort of thing. So, but but I think that I think that that's part, kind of part of their, their story and something that maybe maybe Dario would answer um, in a more kind of eloquent way. But I think it was really sort of based around workers' struggles initially, just in the factory, and then the, that allowed this kind of possibility to develop. Yeah, it's it's funny you mention uh, unite and uh, the uh, 
<laughs> the, the the resolution to that struggle essentially just uh you know being oh yeah take a redundancy package no problem because we were actually talking about um uh, uh, uh earlier on uh gmb who are a bit of a similar kind of yellow union uh in the uk i'm sure you've heard of them sean um but essentially like they had like a bit of a crap deal for delivery drivers uh and then delivery drivers got together and uh they were like actually no we're gonna we're gonna organize with the independent uh workers union of great britain instead and uh, now they're doing all sorts of like more uh radical actions uh and i'm not entirely sure what's going on with the guest rotation but it looks like lorenzo has just dropped out and we're now being joined by dario uh who is as i said earlier one of the workers um uh, uh in the uh uh the the collective the gkm factory collective do you want to introduce yourself dario hi can you hear me yeah loud and clear how are you doing okay oh, same thanks <laughs> <Fine. laughs> yeah. yeah tell us a little bit about um who you are and what you do with the gkn factory collective yeah uh, well uh, i'm a member of the gkn factory collective but i am also a shop steward of um, the cjl metal trade union that is called fiom and uh, uh well i i i was uh 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 i was a worker uh, in uh, in the assembly line uh, as probably you know GKM produced the bar shafts uh, for uh, the main uh, Italian plants of uh, FCA, Stellantis, Fiat. Uh, that means uh, Ferrari, Maserati, Alfa Romeo, Panda, and all other stuffs like uh, like this. That's fantastic. And and so you were basically there when the decision came to occupy the factory, and you've been part of the whole movement to decide to transition away from these kinds of luxury supercar production, uh, 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 you know, products and uh, move into more of a climate friendly mode of production. Do you want to tell us just like a, a little bit about that journey? Obviously the journey is, is, is huge. You know, I'm sure you've got so much to talk to us about, but do you want to just talk to us a little bit about like, you know, what that was like, what your role in that was and, uh, you know, where kind of like how it leads to where you're at now? Well, yeah, uh, in, uh, uh, as probably, you know, in July 21, we received a mail that, uh, told us that we were all, uh, fired, uh, on, it was a Friday morning and, uh, we decided to retake the factory and to start what in Italian is called a permanent assembly that, uh, is a little bit different from, uh, an occupation because, uh, sometimes you associate the idea of occupation um, with uh, a fact in which the workers block the production for uh, asking the request. Uh, but it was clear that uh, it was uh, all the other side, the, the, the bosses, the, 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 the ownership uh, um, block the production, moving the production probably in other countries. Uh, uh, um, so uh, the period between July 21 and, Sep and September 21 was a period in which we were able to defeat with a lot of demonstration uh, and also with uh, with uh, um, with appealing to the law court in Florence. We were able to defeat the layoffs, but. Uh, uh, the ownership didn't bring back the production. So practically we were left alone uh, in a factory where we were in the in, in this permanent assembly, but there was no production and no will of the main ownership to bring uh, back the, the, the production. So we had to start to thinking uh, about a plan to convert the factory in, some, in, some, in something else. So in December 21, we presented for the very, very first time in cooperation with the climate movement, the idea of converting not only our fa factory, but all the factory of the automotives that were dismissed by Stellantis around the big players in a factory that produced public means of transport. Because in, in Italy, we have uh, 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 in, in a theoretical way, we have a, a national industrial 
uh, a national industry of the buses, but that is not uh, that is in crisis without sense because uh, every everybody knows that the public means of transport are needed. Uh, in that moment, uh, uh, there was. Uh, um, but there was a, 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 a turn in the situation because uh, when we uh, proposed the st Italian state, the, tele the Italian government to do this kind of policy, instead the, the ownership of the international speculative fund decided to sell the factory to uh, an Italian boss, to an Italian owner that promised us that was coming a new investor in the future, maybe in the next six, seven, eight months. Uh, it was probably a trick just to let the struggle be exhausted by the waiting of someone that uh, never come. Um, and the main owner started to say that the problem was that uh, the permanent assembly was scaring the big investor that was just behind the hill waiting uh, to to come to 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 give us a new life full of uh, of benefits uh, so in october 22 we were forced to present a second plan but it, this time not a general plan but a plan just about the factory so we had to think how to self recover the factory with a, a workers cup but also not uh, to recover our production that was not our idea and, and was not uh, the case because it's impossible to produce bar shafts without uh, the big uh, uh, automotive players that give you uh, works that that give you the productive volumes to do uh, so we had to think about two new finished goods to be produced in the factory and we thought that it was the case to produce cargo bikes and uh, solar panels. And so we started to elaborate this industrial plan of reconversion of the factory using a lot of different instruments. On one end, the workers' cop. On the other end, we launched this uh, uh, share holding popular campaign because our idea is to link the movement to the ownership of the factory with the contribution, the political, the social, the 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 direction contribution of the, of the of the researchers of the students of the movements but also with a control uh, of the of the cop so that uh, we want that one third of the cop is in the hands of the of the of the share uh, popular shareholders um, till now we have uh, collected uh, interests uh, for uh, uh, 700,000 uh, stocks of this uh, campaign. Uh, but we also say that uh, it's impossible for a single cop, also if it's a very advanced cop, to bring, uh, to, to, to buy all the, all the plant, because the plant is very big, it's uh, 80,000 80, square meters of, uh, of, uh, of area. Uh, so we are asking the regional government to do a law, and we are struggling now for this law that produce the 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 uh, an industrial public uh, subject that uh, is able to buy the area, but also because uh, we think that there is not the chance to bring on a real climate transition without a public intervention in a green product. There is not only a private profit, but there is also a social profit. And uh, the market is not able to uh, test this social profit because the single factory, also if it's a cop factory, can also look, can, can only look to this private uh, product. So, if, for example, it's uh, better for the single factory to produce a bar shaft for Ferrari, they produce that instead of producing a solar panel. But if I do produce a solar panel, I produce something that uh, uh, reduces the pollution, that uh, gives uh, uh, support to, to the uh, um, community of the, of, of the energetic cops that we are trying to, to push uh, forward in all the neighborhoods uh, uh, around us. So it's so, something completely different. So we are asking now for the public intervention, but... Uh, just to sum up, uh, uh, every day that we make a step forward in our plan, the ownership 
and the system or the market, the, 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 the state, the government, as you want to say, call it the, the general system, attack us in a very, very uh, more vicious and direct way. So now we are uh, six months without receiving wage. They have uh, they refused to pay our wages in order to force us to fire ourselves uh, um, voluntary. Um, last year we we were left eight months without receiving any kind of wage. So now, for example, I'm a metal worker and I'm under contract, but I don't receive wages, so I don't re receive an employed an employment an employment benefit. But I don't receive wage. I'm like in a limbo, and uh, that's uh, the reason why we have called a lot of demonstration. We have called the free demonstration in the last uh, six months. Well, we have we have called six demonstration in Florence in 33 months. The last one was uh, in the 18th of May, and it was participated by 10,000 people. It was not the biggest one, but uh, you have to consider that it was the sixth, sixth uh, uh, demonstration in 33 months. After the demonstration, we occupied uh, the, the palace, the building of the regional government. Uh, and we have uh, occupied this uh, building uh, since uh, three days ago. And on uh, Tuesday, for the very first time, we have also added to our uh, instruments of, uh, of uh, struggle the anger strike. So we have entered in an anger strike on uh, on Tuesday morning. And now nowadays, the sixth, uh, sixth uh, day of, uh, of anger strike. And that's, that's only a small part of the story, but at least uh, a general one. That's absolutely fantastic. Thank you for explaining that, uh, Dario. There's so many follow-up questions uh, that I've got uh, regarding that. I think um, the, the biggest thing that you've that you've mentioned there is the way in which the state is responding as you said they're responding in more violent more direct ways every single time uh, and i think you probably would agree that that is because this way in which that you know you and your fellow workers are actually taking control of the production and taking control of your own labor um you know and 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 deciding to do something productive for not just for yourselves, but for uh, uh, for the entire planet, you know, lo locally, globally, you're thinking globally, you're acting locally, um, and uh, it's just not something that the the people who are interested in profit, uh, interested in extracting a lot of wealth and extracting, uh, you know, stealing wages from uh, from people's labor. That's kind of what they're used to. It's just not what they're interested in, right? Um, but I, I, yeah, I think um, the I, one of the questions that I wanted to ask. So just kind of like going back a little bit um, into like sort of, you know, the early days of the the beginning of the occupation, the beginning of the assembly, as you call it, um, the permanent assembly. Um, what kind of, I guess, you had this email this one day, and I guess what I'm trying to like get in my head is, is you know, what kind of collective decision was made? Was there an emergency meeting between unionized workers? How did it play out? Well, um, the democracy during the, the class struggle is something uh, 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 very complicated and different from the democracy that uh, we think normally. Definitely. <laughs> because uh, it's uh, a democracy in which action and words uh, have to be switched very, very quickly. And uh, it, 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 uh, it, the, the, the question uh, of uh, who, for example, starts a revolution, a revolution never starts with a general vote in which, in which people say, okay, now we start a revolution. But in a, in, a, in a certain way, it's the most uh, democratic uh, process that uh, you can see in life. Uh, so it was a long, uh, a long period in which we, we prepared ourselves for the, the chance to be, to be shut down by the, the speculative fund. We were spoken about it uh, for years. Uh, and it was like if uh, people uh, didn't discuss in that moment because they had discussed it in the in the last uh, decade at least. Uh, during the period of 2018, 2021, in which uh, 
we had different strikes against the the policy of this uh, fund, this uh, speculative fund. Uh, we always won the strikes that uh, were all ended with uh, some agreements in which they say that uh, no layoffs were coming. And if they were coming, they would have said it to us in a very uh, 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 large time so that we had time to prepare. But uh, we didn't trust these agreements. So what we basically did was to sign also agreements uh, to develop uh, uh, an, a, a most radical democracy inside the factory. We had the normal factory council, but we also uh, enlarged it with other uh, uh, 12 shop stewards so that practically we were able to cover all the area of the factories and we were looking at, at what was the real life of the factory not what uh, they said in the in the in the meetings and uh, also we 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 established the the collectivo in 2018 but the collectivo was was really an idea that was developed in 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 different years with other names but uh, we established uh, a name and and a practice um so that practically that morning when uh, we were shut down there was not an assembly or a, or a rem- or emergency vote uh we just gathered uh, in front of the factory and we knew that we had to uh go in there were there were uh, armed guards that uh, we have never seen that uh, had taken the the control of the factory they were without uh, any kind of uniform so it was uh, very likely to some kind of fascist squad because there were people without uniform but that were uh, defending the the factory uh, we we just knew that uh, we had to do that uh, so really i don't know who, who took the decision and uh, I, I i didn't remember who uh, started but uh, we were all uh, able to well to open the main gate and to 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 go back uh, so the the reality is that that when action come uh, you have to if you can you have to arrive in that moment with uh, uh, some kind of selection of the method of the ideas and of the people that in in, in that time are more in charge than other to take the decision and we had a long preparation to a single moment that was that uh, moment in that uh, morning. And also the permanent assembly, it was impossible to establish a permanent assembly in a so quick way without a long training of workers' democracy, more radical workers' democracy that at the right moment was able to convert itself in the permanent assembly. So this is a fantastic demonstration, I think, of what I've been learning quite recently. Um, I've been on a training course um, as part of, uh, uh, you know, being being one of the organizers of Greater Manchester Tenants Union, um, and it's called Organizing for Power, and it and it's it's uh, sort of like a, 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 I think the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation they fund it um and uh these people in in america who are part of this foundation or this organization called jane mccalevy organization um they're doing this training and and one of the things that they're really 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 going hard on is how you absolutely need structure right and what this is what you're telling us dario is that this constant reaffirmation within the unionized workers of the structure and how you know and and not just the structure not just having a structure but also discussing radical options when radical situations arise right um and i guess preparing people for that kind of a scenario uh preparing your fellow workers and identifying key leaders as you say like in situations like that where there are these unprecedented scenarios uh, whether it's on a demonstration, whether it's in, in an occupation, whether it's, you know, in anything, uh, any kind of organization, you're going to get people who need to, you need to rely on the people who have that cool head um, and and they're able to basically direct people, um, you know, but, but understanding as well that actually like, they're not just telling people what to do with no plan or anything. This is something that's been discussed 
previously for for a long long time everybody's agreed to it there's a there's a large amount of like you say like actual democracy uh that has led to this decision uh and i think that this is just like a fantastic demonstration of that so so that that was kind of like how it happened what led up to it absolutely fantastic what was what was the the boss's response like the first response like what 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 did they say to you well uh in the very first day of uh of this uh of, of the birth of uh, the permanent assembly there was a so huge popular movement around the factory that was impossible to react in any way and uh, we had also prepared that of course, we were, we were lucky that uh, the Florence uh, area is uh, an area where uh, the anti-fascism uh, tradition, the trade union tradition is uh, strong. And uh, it was uh, lucky for us uh, because all the left wing association, trade union association, but also also, uh, also the rank and files of the Catholic movement, uh, uh, supported us and uh, so there was immediately thousands of people uh, gathering around the factory that was a combination of different uh, uh, f- uh, factors one is the tradition I have already mentioned it and the second one was that uh, in the president years we were always uh, careful of uh, uh, keeping links between the factory and the area and uh, all the movements not only trade union movements, but all the movements, for example, environmental movements. Uh, there was, uh, there, was uh, there is a, a struggle in our area, for example, against uh, the enlargement of the airport or, uh, or, or yeah, d- different, different struggle like this. And uh, so that uh, where everybody knew that the GKN was shut down, it was like if a piece of history of the, of the area was, uh, was shut down. And so we had a so big movement around us that it was impossible for them to take any reaction. They denounced us uh, for the permanent assembly. They told us that we were illegal and so on. But uh, the reality is that uh, there was uh, immediately uh, a, day, a day of strike in the province with uh, 10,000 people participating after five days other 8,000 participating in the demonstration inside the, uh, in front of the factory. The 18th of September, 40,000 people participating in a demonstration in Florence, and it was all in two months. And the other factor was uh, our message, because uh, in that period, we were coming from the lockdown uh, of the COVID. It was the summer 21. And uh, all in Italy, it has been lost one million uh one million and a half jobs places in totally in silence without any kind of of protest demonstration so we 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 asked ourselves why one of these one million people that have lost their jobs without any kind of protest should be in solidarity with uh, our factory that uh, is, is is one is a, a small part of the of the entire uh, uh, working class. So we say that uh, we didn't have to put forward the slogan uh, um, "Ends of GKN." Uh, it was a, a selfish slogan. Uh, our slogan was uh, "Insurgiamo, rise up." That uh, "Insurgiamo" was. Um, a motto of the uh, partisans' resistance in Florence, and and it was yes, that's it, that's it, and it was it is it was a way to say that uh, it was a way to say that uh, it's impossible to win a battle in a single factory, and that uh, it it was impossible to call a solidarity movement of so so many peoples without saying that uh, uh, GKN had to be uh, like a point of support to. Re- reopen the battle in, in all the in all the in all the uh, world of, uh, of, of well in, in all the job uh, world and and this uh, was the reason why till now uh, the repression could have could have not beaten us uh, directly with the with the with the, yeah, for example with the police or other things like this. Uh, 
but as I as I told you, they, they had to use some kind of tactic of slow exhaust, slow in exhausting the the struggle. Also now, for example, we are in the main struggle of Florence because we have occupied the main struggle of Florence uh, to to put the anger of strike in 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 the in well uh, at the site of all the town, and that this is not clearly a, a legal situation. But they are not uh, attacking us because they know that we have uh, a large support uh, among the population. You have to consider that, uh, and this is a very incredible social experiment. If you look, for example, you were saying to you were saying to uh think globally and act uh, locally um I, I don't remember the figure the exact figures and i cannot read it but uh, um uh, upon 700,000 um uh, euro of uh, stocks uh that have been booked in the share popular uh, uh older campaign like uh, uh 2000 come to to um, 200,000, sorry, come from the rest of Europe and 268,000 come only from Florence. So that you you can see the, the international strength, the national strength, because of course there is a lot of uh, of, of uh, support from Italy, but in, in particular the strength in, in, in the town. That's absolutely incredible. Dario, earlier you were saying that there was a strong tradition in the area that you're in. And you said a strong anti-fascist tradition, a strong union tradition. And I was just wondering how much you see those as linked or even the same thing, like um, whether that's like, um, yeah, like because I obviously it, Italy has had historic and contemporary struggles with fascism. And I'm wondering how much like the worker movement and resistance against fascism uh, interlink for you and, 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 and for, the, for the people there. Everything has got a positive side and a negative side. There is not only one side of the question. The fact that we have a very, very democratic anti-fascist tradition and trade union tradition is a positive thing. For example, it was impossible for them to attack us with a fascist squad. Well, after in the last months, something similar has happened, but this is another history. Uh, I, I, I don't go in just for uh, for lack of of time, uh, but uh, you have also also to say that this tradition of uh, democratic anti-fascist uh, uh, trade union movement has also meant that this tradition in the years have been have become a little bit fossilized, bureaucratic, so that for example uh, the the class. Uh, the class nature of the anti-fascism sometimes has been replaced by a general democratic uh, anti-fascism that is not the case of what was the real resistance because the real resistance started with the in Italy started with the uh, worker strikes in uh, March 23 and then April uh, uh, sorry uh, March uh, 43 and uh, April 44 uh and uh, the the big uh, impulse to the to the anti-fascist resistance was given by these general strikes of the of the workers uh but on the other hand uh, it's it's uh, it's full uh, inside of the factory inside of trade unions uh, of a lot of uh, event that uh, pay some kind of lip service to the history of uh, of the resistance and it's something that we have used to refresh this tradition and to say, of course, we're anti-fascist. And so, of course, it's normal that our struggle has got an anti-fascist motto. There is something that has always have given us immediately a clear, uh, um, well, a, a clear uh, a profile of what we were trying to 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 do. Fantastic. Um, so yeah, so you've talked a little bit about, you've talked about the start, you've talked about what the response was, you've talked about the link between the anti-fascism and the, and the trade union movement, uh, at least in Italy at large. Uh, and obviously it's probably going to be the same in Firenze, right? Um, that's what it, it's stronger in Firenze is, is, uh, what you're saying. Um, so I wonder then, obviously then it became, you know, these big, 
demonstrations. It's absolutely fascinating, by the way. I'm really finding it like <laughs> it's a little bit overwhelming, actually, uh, just learning the 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 sort of history and, and what's gone on. So I wonder then, um, and I think this is good because while, while we've got Sean here, uh, he could tell us a little bit uh, as well um, about the sort of like decision for you to transition away from this uh, fossil fuel based car vehicle sort of luxury car uh, mode of production into environmentally friendly stuff. Um, so I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about like, you know, what, what exactly, what are the, what are the hardships? What are the, what are the, what are the hard parts of trying to like, you know, refurbish? Cause you're going to have to, you know, you must've had to have refurbished the entire factory, like different uh, 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 assembly line, uh, different, production, this kind of stuff. So talk to us about some of the difficulties in that and some of the help that you've had from, uh, you know, a, a, a sort of like people who have a bit more experience in, in that in that way of producing things. Oh. <laughs> but obviously, uh, if that's a bit of a bad question, I do apologize. Uh, no, 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 no. Answer it's it as best bad, you can. <laughs> it's, not a, it's not a bad question, but which, there are so many things to say that I have to try to find some of them and not uh, all of them well uh the conversion of the factory uh it's clearly something that uh, free us from our old production and uh, this is a good thing because we can start from uh, uh real ecological production um on the other end uh, it, uh, it it has got some problems the first problem is that uh, you need an investment if you just retake the the means of production that are already there, of course uh, you need the investments too, but uh, less investments. And this is one problem. The second problem is that uh, the second problem is that uh, the workers' democracy is based on workers' knowledge, and uh, we know everything about our old production. But we don't know practically nothing. Well, now we have trained ourselves, we have reskilled ourselves uh, with, uh, uh, with with the new production. But of course, it's something that we don't know. We will learn the new production. So we have to base yourself uh, on uh, the help of external competences, solidarity competences that give you uh, this support. Uh, and this clearly this is something that can weak a little bit the democracy among the workers because you are speaking about a thing that uh, you don't know directly uh, and this is another problem that you have to face that's that's why we need a, a strong solidarity movement around the factory because if you think only of retaking the factory on its basis clearly you can base yourself only on the workers we were able to to well, to control and to self-produce uh, what our our bar shop without any problems, but it's something different with the new machinery that uh, we would like to to buy. So we you need a starting a, a starting investment. You need knowledge helped from the outside. This is a moment in which the the democracy can be weakened inside the, the workers uh, inside the workers uh, uh, community. Um, and another problem is the structure, the social structure of of the of the factor that we want to create, because we don't want to shift from uh, exploitation to self exploitation. Uh, when you when you build a cop, if if it's a real democratic and workers cop, uh, because in Italy a lot of cops are not cops uh, at all. Um, if you build a, a real uh, workers uh, cooperatives, clearly uh, it, it it doesn't it doesn't end your clash with the capital. The clash with the capital just uh, is uh, uh, is on a, on a, on another level. Is between the the cooperative and the man and the market between the cooperative and the banks between the cooperative and the price of the product. And uh, uh, particularly if you're speaking about the price of green products, you can have a lot of paradox. Uh, for example, if we include in our, just, just an example, if, you, if we include in our business plan, the recovering of the solar panel, that it could be a good thing to have also the, 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 the recycles of the solar panel, 
the profit profitability of of our business plan <laughs> uh slow down uh so something that is good for the for the for the production and also for us it's, it's something that uh that for example our uh, some of our uh, um, social investors uh, have asked us not to put that in the plan because if not the plan is uh, less rentable is less profitable but uh, we are resisting to uh, to it so uh, if we want to resist the market, not to win the market, because I think that the market can be win in another ways, not just with the single island. But if we want to go on with this clash to the market, it, it, it has to be clearly a clash that is on capitalistic basis. So we know that our product has to be uh, competitive. And if it's not competitive at all, it's really difficult to stay on the market. But on the other end, we have to change a little bit of the competition. For example, what we are trying to do is to uh, develop the movement of uh, the riders in order that uh, our cargo bikes uh, is something that uh, is linked to the development of, of, of the clash in, in, the, in the rider sector and that we give our cargo bikes to the other cops that are developing ethical uh, delivery. Or for example, we are uh, asking uh, for direct cooperation with the energy energy uh, cooperative communities in order that uh, we try to be the factory of a movement, not just a factory of the market. Uh, this is this is not something that can solve uh, uh, totally the problem of the markets. As I was saying, the 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 factory that we are trying to restart will remain a factory inside the capitalist market. It's impossible to change this this situation in just one factory but we have to uh, to also to involve the movement in this clash developing different uh, social structures uh, other mutual aid association uh, other neighborhood uh, assembly that uh, speak about what what's happening in the factory that knows why they have to uh, use the solar panel of the factory and of, and the factory that is at the disposal that is is at the, at the service uh, of uh, of these uh, of these movements so these are uh, is our project we have called it uh, social integrated factory it's a way to call a public factory but also uh, stressing the fact that we are not speaking about the classical nationalization sector that we have been uh, uh, that that we normally think of because also, in this period of neoliberalism, the state is intervening in the in the economy. Uh, here they have nationalized the uh, Ilva, that is a steel plant. Elitalia, that was the, the national uh, airplane uh, company. A lot of banks, they are producing a lot of uh, arms. Uh, so the state is really present in the, in the economy, uh, a lot of, uh, uh, present in the economy. So the, we are asking for the public intervention and also for for state capital, but with a, a control uh, from below, both on the factory, both on the area, and also that in, in the way that our product is not only a product, it's a product, but it's something that uh, to stay alive has got to develop new balance of forces into the inside the society at all at all levels. Yeah. Absolutely incredible. Like it, it, the the way in which that you are trying to, I guess, like empower this this connection, this network of uh, different co ops all over Italy in the in the relations that you're building. Like you said um, earlier, that's like I, I think a really important um, um, decision that you've made. Um, so yeah, and and I guess like while while we've still got Sean, I don't know how much time either of you have got, but um, uh, Sean, if you want to tell us sort of like, uh, uh, you know, what kind of um, I guess like uh, stuff that you were talking about and the decisions that you helped make, uh, or like advised the guys at the factory to do, um, with regards to like cargo bikes and all that stuff, because I think the cargo bike thing is like a bit of a, I think it's a bit of an interesting thing. Like I've seen cargo bikes all over Manchester and I think it's just something that like people don't really talk about too much. Cause they're a bit like, 
what's this? I've never really seen one of these before. Um, but yeah, talk, talk to us, just, I guess, like, give us a little bit of an idea. Like, maybe there's some people in the US who just have no fucking clue what a cargo bike is. Like, they live in, like, Ohio or something. And, I've uh, so- never heard of them in New Zealand. I've never heard of them <laughs> before. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah, give us, a, give us a quick rundown of what a cargo bike is. Um, and also, like, yeah, the connection that you brought to the, the, the factory in Firenze. Yeah, sure. So um, a cargo bike, uh, I feel like I'm at work now. Um, <laughs> yeah, so cargo bikes are, are just, you know, bicycles for normally they have like a platform at the front or they can have like an extended platform at the back for um, for putting kids on. But but the type that GKN are focusing on is like more in the, for the logistics sector. So it's basically trying to take um, van deliveries, the kind of like last mile deliveries, um, that are either done on scooters or on on mopeds um, in most cities, and putting them onto um, onto cargo bikes, which are obviously very sort of green form of transport, and they require kind of different street um, infrastructure in terms of like um, you know you can park quite easily, you can um, there's just a lot less insurance you don't need driver's licenses for the people's people that are riding them so there's a lot of benefits for like logistics companies and which is why you're definitely seeing them in manchester but like in the city i live in um there's not so many so so it's just like it's a kind of thing where it, once it takes off it can can really take off um and in terms of like how that looks in relation to what dario was talking about in terms of communities or cooperative organizations um really the way that the um, cargo bike logistics industries have gone um, is that they've been really um, kind of pump primed like fintech companies like Deliveroo, Uber, um, and and they were the kind of first entrance into this area of like cycle logistics, mainly around food in the UK. But now you would be seeing like um, DHL or some of like the ma- major logistics companies using cargo bikes as well obviously just because that they're like far more efficient than a van if you've got a lot of, of small packages to deliver around like lots of small streets um so that's that's like a kind of um a kind of intro to it in terms of like what 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 they're working on um and why I was there it was mainly I heard about it through um the co-op cycle which is a federation of um co-op delivery uh career career groups um of which there's i think there's maybe two in the uk at the moment um but they're much more active in in other countries in europe and, and mexico as well um and it's basically just like a federated um it's like an open source technology for um well it's not actually open source it's like um sort of copy left in terms of they they control the copyright but they allow groups to use them but only so long as they're cooperatives and they're using uh non-fossil fuel um delivery vehicles basically so so they've got a kind of like the the copyright that they've used is one that that um they control but in a in a democratic way so that other logistics companies can't use it um which is which is interesting but i think that because the the market in the UK was really like jump started, um, and we didn't have this kind of um, strong career networks already in cities, like like you were saying earlier at the beginning of the show. Um, you know, a lot of the communities who are involved in doing the e bike deliveries now they're often migrant communities. They're not necessarily in a like most of them in at least in my city are brazilian and they're not necessarily in the the situation where they know how to set up a co-op where to get the money to to buy all the e-bikes and stuff so it's very much like um you know it's gone a certain direction in the uk that's not to say that we can't uh change that but but compared to say in in paris there's maybe you know, there's a whole bunch of, of delivery co-ops. Some of them, you know, they split the city into sectors and they try not to compete with each other, but they'll have loads of workers to the extent where where they actually built their own own um, own app um, instead of using the co-op cycle app because they were just working so much in, in this one area with so many careers. 
Um, so there's, it's really like a, it's an area that, that um, GKN could be supplying a lot of cargo bikes to if we were working it, you know, the, the way that they can compete in, in the market is to be working with, solidarity organizations with organizations to support their goals and would rather be buying from them than from some of the like many other competitors because it is like a now becoming like a kind of saturated market in terms of like if you run a bike shop in the uk that, that sells cargo bikes there's lots of companies coming to us and saying oh you know can you can you distribute our, our bikes or can you distribute ours almost more than like the actual demand for cargo bikes is and um, because you can imagine, well, just because we haven't really had the kind of cycle revolution type thing in, in the way that they have in other European cities in the past sort of post-pandemic years. So, yeah, so that's a, that's a kind of introduction to <laughs> to cargo bikes. Um, but, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I think that there are probably more questions for that for Dario than for me. Yeah, that's really interesting. I actually, I didn't, I wasn't familiar with the, to the term cargo bikes, um, but I, I, I looked up a picture while you were describing them and I realized that actually several businesses in South London that I know actually use them. Um, so when you're talking about, you were talking just then about um, uh, only working with solidarity organizations, only working with co-ops and that kind of, a kind of model that's like, um, in a sense, like acting exclusively and somewhat hostilely to capitalist logics. And I'm kind of curious if, and this is open to either of you, like um, you have thoughts on um where that's going economically like the the growth of a a, a kind of um solidarity of these uh cooperative businesses um what the like in your best case scenario the 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 strength of these of these organizations working together um i mean like the best case scenario is always revolution but like i mean the kind of the the roadmap as it were if that makes sense so i, I hope this is this is making some sense and just in terms of like the the solidarity economy stuff, um, it does a sort of more established term in in like Spain, Catalonia. Um, we don't really have that concept, and I think that like in the UK, just like say the market for buying bikes from GKN is probably quite small. Um, and I guess the difficulties with with having like a big productive industry. Um, like you know, like GKM, where they're where they're trying to produce lots of bikes, is you need you need a, a lot of groups and organisations who are going to want to buy those bikes. And I, I guess like um, the movement, that's why we're sort of trying to talk about it in in lots of different places, is because you know we, it, we need to reach kind of across uh, you know more than just you know of, obviously there's loads of support for the factory itself in. In Florence, but for that to be across Europe is is a, is a different thing in terms of like the products are, are like the finished products need to to be distributed a lot wider. It's not like a a kind of a lot of the other ways that solidarity economy groups are. There'll be like local agriculture, these sorts of things where it's it's a lot it's a lot closer. And that's kind of why I'm really interested in this in this project because it's like thinking about like you know a lot of production of cargo bikes. And of bicycles in general will go on in China or Taiwan, and then it will be kind of just shipped in, and it won't have any connection. So what what they're talking about with this socially integrated factory is, you know, there's this need for sustainable transportation in Europe, and we can produce it here, and we can distribute it here instead of producing car. You know, uh, company uh, not companies countries tend to like keep their like key industry, the auto industry, in their countries because it's a very like um you know productive you know if you're selling ferraris or, or maseratis that's that looks really good from the perspective of the italian state but but um you know selling cargo bikes to to co-ops is, is very different so so there's this kind of like idea of like how do we and i'm not it's not exactly like i think what i like about um what dario was talking about earlier about the social economy uh, sorry about the socially integrated and factory is very different to this idea of a circular economy, which is just like, oh, we'll just try and keep the money in like a closed loop. But actually what they're talking about isn't just circulating the money or the materials. It's about meeting the needs of the community sort of thing. So maybe maybe that answers the, the question a little bit. Yeah. Do, do, do you want another answer or, or another question as you, as you if like? Yes, if you have yes more please. To say about, if you have more to say about <laughs> solidarity economy, Dario, please do. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, well, I, I do agree with Sean, so I don't have to add uh, a lot of things. And, and, and then I have also to leave uh, my place to Lorenzo if he can uh, can join because at the, <laughs> we are in the sixth uh, day of hunger uh, strike, so we are a little bit uh, uh, weak. Um, uh, well, the fact is that uh, here we have uh, entered... Uh, in, into a vacuum uh, because uh, substantially uh, what we are doing is something that the capital is saying that should be done because the green transition, the green production, uh, producing European solar panel, um, changing the delivery in, in the urban area, something that they say, but they don't do. So what the what 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 we were uh, left to do is to uh, to plan this conversion of the factory, showing that really uh, also if you put uh, the transition on a capital on a capitalist basis, the capitalism is not doing this uh, transition, and if uh, the capitalism does this transition, does it only in a very partial and only in a very um, uh, slow in, in uh, way that is something that uh, is not uh, going uh, um, uh, that is something that is clashing with the need of a radical and urgent climate uh, transition if we if we think about uh, the uh, growing production of uh, of the military sector what is more polluting and what is more uh, uh, in opposition to the climate transition to to raise the the production of uh, of the military of the military sector and uh, in the moment in which we are developing an industrial project that uh, unmask uh the capitalism uh, uh, under this uh, under this uh, way clearly we are, we are forced to go on economic uh, sector and uh, if we don't want to be um, to be in a certain sense uh, uh, to be corrupted by this transition to the economic and uh, uh, to take the power not to be taken by the power that's something completely different uh, clearly, we have to develop the community around the around the the, the project and to develop the general movement, uh, the political, social, climate uh, uh, movement, in order uh, that the COP still remain an instrument of this movement and not the opposite, not the movement, uh, an instrument of the. Uh, uh, of the of the of the cop um, yeah basically basically this what i have to say in 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 the end is that uh, this is the the future that we are trying to establish but uh, the present is, is 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 more more different without uh, we are without wages so every day we are losing uh, workers that are not able to resist anymore uh, we are trying to slow down the 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 quitting of the workers with the resistance cash with the social workers mutual aid making small productions uh, but it's clear that uh, if we uh, are not able to clash uh, this ownership and uh, to force the public intervention to retake uh, the factory uh, with the with the public capital is difficult to resist uh, uh, to resist uh, anymore. It's now it's like uh, thirty three uh, months of a permanent assembly, more than uh, one thousand days, and uh, we have uh, suffered. We have. Uh, uh, answered any kind of of attacks. The last one was was at the beginning of April, when uh, a commando of un unknown uh, people entered into the factory during the night of Easter, uh, and uh, they destroyed the main uh, electricity cabin, and uh, so that the factory has been uh, left without any kind of electricity, and in three days. The climate movement
was able to bring solar panel to us from the rest of Europe. And uh, with our knowledge, uh, we established this uh, solar panel uh, so that uh, the trade union garrison in front of the factory now is completely going with uh, solar energy so that uh, the boycott of this unknown commando that we don't know who has sent it, but we have the suspicion that was sent, of course, by the ones that were uh, interested in leaving the factory in the dark. Uh, this this uh, fact was uh, counter uh, counterbalanced that the fact that uh, now we are we have a trade union garrison and the permanent assembly is going with the with solar energy in, in only three in only three days. This is, I think, the most concrete example of what it could be, of what the combination of uh, social movements, climate movements, cooperation, and also. Uh, going into the economic, uh, not only as a way to have a different example of what it could be, but also to develop a new uh, leading, uh, a new leading class. Because sometimes we speak about changing, about revolution, but uh, uh, the, the, sometimes we only come to the, to the moment uh, in which the, a social movement develops that uh, we have passed years and years in opposition, writing leaflets, writing pamphlets calling strikes, everything that is needed. But also you have to see to this kind of social experiments like a way to understand how we would run our neighborhood, how we would run our factory, how we would run our school and our university. Clearly, if we if you, if you concentrate only on the question of self-government in a society that is not your society, there is the, the 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 risk. There is the danger that you you could be uh, cooptated by this uh, by the society. But if you use this experiment of social communities, cooperatives, and other stuff like that, like a way to train yourself to run things like you would run if the society would be in your hands. You have uh, the social opposition, you have the movements, you have the struggle, but you have also the chance to develop new social cadres, new community cadres that uh, are able one day to to run uh, society in, uh, in another way. That is yeah. truly inspirational um, and uh, fully, fully, fully agree. Dario, I know... Oh, sorry, Sophie, did you have something? I was, to is, I'll keep it really quick, but it reminded yeah. me of something that when we were on the ZAD and we were talking to Jay... They said to us that um, they, they they said to us a moment when they were really sh like they became sure they were gonna win against the cops and against the state trying to shut down their their occupation of the Notre Dame de Land Zad was when uh, the cops had come in and had smashed a tank they were using it was actually a bathtub they were using to heat their water to have hot water in the in the commune they were in and they'd done a bunch of other stuff they'd like flashbang people who were like. Um, uh, sleeping, they'd thrown smoke grenades into like a, a building that had like children sleeping in it. They'd arrested a bunch of people. Uh, it was horrible. But the next morning, there were just like people from the surrounding communities and loads of volunteer activists had come in and were repairing everything. And they saw like Jay described to us seeing six people carry six people they'd never met and didn't know carrying in a new bathtub to replace the one that the cops had smashed up with the sledgehammer. And that's from, just reminded me of that, your story about the solar panels. And I think that is such a clear like demonstration of having the kind of integrated community and social power that makes it, uh, yeah, uh, yeah ma makes it viable, makes, makes you win, right? Like just makes it, you know, takes it all the way. Um, yeah. Thank you, Dario. Um, you, I know that you're, you've got to get off. We've got to get Lorenzo back on, but that's, a fantastic answer and all of your uh, contributions have been amazing ciao ciao, ciao. solidarity thank you so Thanks. much for joining us Good Dario with the um, hunger strike as well it's gonna be tough yeah it is <laughs> but okay <laughs> we, we keep on ciao ciao Hell ciao yeah. ciao Thanks. Yeah, that was uh, absolutely incredible. So uh, yeah, we just had Dario there for a short time um, I didn't even know that he was I actually knew that the ex -GK, GKN workers were participating in a hunger strike. I was going to ask that question, but I didn't know that he personally was participating. So I think that's really good of him to come on despite all of that. Welcome back, Lorenzo. 
Yeah, hey guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know I know it's not the same having me and having Dario, but he would have to. <laughs> make, make no, sure I think uh, no, I think it's definitely uh, 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 very good because uh, you know now you two can sort of like answer some of the questions that we're going to ask uh dario did what he could and uh this is this is kind of this is kind of what it's like uh doing revolutionary stuff right you know sometimes things don't quite work out the way that you think it's going to do so you got to do things a little different it's all good um so i think like one of the one of the main things i wanted to ask either of you if either of you know the answer um because i know that you you've both had like a lot of uh, uh you know communication with the with the workers in in the in the factory um is what kind of what you know Dario spoke to us about like you know having things sabotaged by random fucking fascist gangs uh what is general life being like in the in the permanent assembly because i imagine the factory is going to have to be manned 24/7 right yeah uh so they have shifts uh so if you if you go to the factory I mean, it's quite an experience and I encourage anybody that can do uh, to go uh, because it's crazy how it's a place, if you go inside, it seems like time has stopped for three years uh, because the thing was that uh, they had to act quickly to keep the machinery and the materials inside because once the machinery and the materials are out, then uh, you don't have any bargaining power. So as the workers like to say, not one bullet exited the factory since they started the takeover. Uh, and so you have these massive boxes with the uh, axles that are, you know, under a layer of powder. And you have all these uh, fancy machines that they, you know, with the industry 4.0 technology that the management bought with the Italian state subsidies before <laughs> abandoning the factory. Uh, so, so you go there and there's this massive parking lot. And um, the trade union garrison is uh, the first sort of small building uh, in the parking lot, which was, I guess, used by the guardians. And uh, they set up uh, a cafeteria slash a bar in there. Uh, and uh, so somebody is always there uh, on, on shifts. And uh, it's a lot of uh, playing cards and uh, watching football. <laughs> as far as <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. That's, that's the like daily life, and and then meetings, like obviously, like you know how it is. Uh, so every week, uh, there's uh, all kinds of meetings with the solidarity groups that visit. Um, so once, for instance, I was there to present the Venice Climate Camp of 2022. Uh, and so back then, I don't know how it is. Uh, I guess recently it's changed because now they're occupying also the. Um, uh, area in front of the regional administration. They had a weekly so-called uh, cultural convergence and that was open uh, to the general public and they would uh, every time propose a different type of cultural event with uh, music, uh, poetry, book presentations, etc. And uh, that time it was just us. Uh, so these guys that came from a different region uh, to talk about the climate camp and there was, I think, you know, 150 and 200 people just for that. And that's because that was basically not because we're famous, <laughs> but because there's this community of people that used to go to the factory every week anyways, because that's where the sociability would be for that period. So I was also very powerful. And also inside of the factory, uh, there is the, um, the place where the workers sit was the English word for that. Uh, anyways. Caf cafeteria. Yeah, there you go. Whole, I mean, yeah. Enough. Yeah. Uh, and so that's used for the for the meetings. So another time I was there for a meeting of different trade union branches from all across Italy. So it's basically they put the factory, it's a massive space, also at the service of the broader Italian and uh, when possible international uh, anti-capitalist movements, uh, both from the workplaces and the communities. And uh, every anniversary they've done this massive concert uh, and uh, a political event outside of the factory with uh, thousands of people there. Also, you know, uh, buses coming from Germany, and Austria, and Switzerland. Uh, and so that's uh, if, you know, uh, there's going to be that uh, event this year. It's going to be on the 12th of July. So if anybody, you know, listening 
wants to uh, come down, that would be very much appreciated, of course. Oh, I've just realized you're absolutely, thank you for reminding me that we have podcast listeners because uh, Dario's accent probably betrayed him a little bit. He was saying cops quite a lot and he definitely was meaning co-ops. Just yeah. so our podcast listeners are aware, that was an accent thing. He wasn't talking about how good cops are. And um, uh, uh, and <laughs> he was saying uh, cooperatives and um, corporations, as, but like corporate, it sounded like corporations. Um, a yes. Couple times I yeah, was yeah, like, yeah. wait, oh, you know, and then, uh, yeah. I, simply, I choose to trust the podcast listeners and their, their powerful ears, but they, they, well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I hope they, I hope they fucking do have powerful ears. Um, <laughs> so, okay, great. That's great. Thanks for, uh, that Lorenzo. Um, so yeah, another thing, uh, that I wanted to ask, and I wonder if you know the answer to this, either of you know the answer to this. Um, so this is the kind of weapon that the, that the bosses are using against them. They're saying, right, no more money, right? So no pay. Um, that's what we're doing. You're not getting your salary. You're not getting anything. Um, I mean, this might be a stupid question, but I imagine like with it being eight months, they're not coming to the table. They're not negotiating. They're not speaking to the workers at all. Yeah, not at the moment. Uh, so there has been negotiations, uh, uh, but what happens is that, um, they have been uh, lengthening the time, as Dario was saying, as much as possible because, you know, obviously workers' reproduction is tied to capitalist work. And therefore, if you stay without wages for long, then you're in a bad situation. That's the proletarian condition, basically. Mm -hmm. and, and the bosses know it. Uh, so the, the negotiations haven't really been serious in, a, in the way that... Uh, before, uh, the first result was that uh, the factory was bought by this Italian investor uh, that has no experience in automotive-related production, but actually these deals with uh, rubbish management uh, in some regions of Italy. Uh, and, and he was meant to then uh, build a um, consortium, a coalition of uh, entrepreneurs that would uh, kickstart production, but he never got to the stage of being serious with that. So the industrial plan was just a bunch of slides, like PowerPoint kind of thing. And, uh, you know, no serious money coming in for that. Um, so the, the collective has been uh, campaigning a lot to show that um, there's been some investigative journalism as well, uh, found some evidence that the plan seems to have always been, although there is not 100% def uh, evidence, but a lot of indications uh, of uh, real estate speculation to turn the factory into some uh, tourism, hospitality, uh, and uh, commercial uh, kind of thing. And therefore, uh, the idea was never to reindustrialize that. So, so those negotiations haven't been in good faith. Uh, and now the, these investors say, oh, yes, yeah, you know, these workers have uh, been uh, having this permanent assembly at the factory that scared off potential investors and the four is on my fourth. Uh, you know, I, I always wanted to help out. And that's the situation right now. So now the main uh, counterpart, the main um, uh, sort of uh, people that per type of person, well, entity that they want to bring to the negotiating table is rather the regional government. Uh, the national government is a far right government, as you know, fortunately, so they've been quite, uh, resistant to the demand of uh, nationalization under workers' control, <laughs> as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. uh, but the um, regional government is uh, central left, so obviously they have no interest in doing it either. But in their electoral base, there are people that would like them to do it. Uh, so it's a bit easier to push on that side. Uh, so that's the that's what thing, things are standing at the moment. Yeah, I mean, that is another like demonstration of what we tend to repeat on the show, which is that politicians are only really useful insofar as how you can use them to, you know, lose your chains, right? Like, it, it, it's it's kind of one of these situations. We have discussions in uh, Greater Manchester Tenants Union, like quite, well, not regularly, but I guess frequently, um, just sort of discussing like, you know, can we push this politician to do some stuff for housing? Can we push this politician? Can we, you know, use our influence to speak to this politician? And I'm always saying, 
forget it, man. Like, we, you know, we, we can we can do a, a, a lot better than wasting our time with that. So I think that's another great demonstration of, of, of that, really, uh, in most organizing uh, uh, situations. There's only so much you can do to appeal to someone who kind of knows that the game is is rigged in their favor and they're not really that interested in doing any kind of actual uh, uh you know progressive uh, i guess uh, uh progressive uh, making any progressive changes in society so uh another thing i wanted to ask was um what kind of so uh, Dario was talking about like hundreds of thousands of people and, and I think you touched on this uh, briefly just before Dario came on um hundreds of thousands of people like turning up to support the 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 factory and all this kind of stuff it sounded absolutely amazing what kind of and and also the solar panels the solar panels was was really interesting what other kind of solidarity actions have, have been made by the local community or even at least the the italian uh, labor movement and uh, leftist movement at large okay so um well the, the demonstrations have been uh, tens of thousands of people at the same time so the largest ones were forty thousand people which is still huge for a factory okay of- not hundreds of thousands i've misunderstood but that's still big that's still huge yeah yeah i mean so they then they estimate that if you uh bring all the demonstrations together that's uh, more than hundred thousand people definitely that were involved in demonstrations uh so yes what's uh what's been happening is that uh the they had the largest demonstrations in uh florence uh many times but also they had this idea that if they got stuck in florence uh then uh, they would sort of um you know lose uh the national projection and international projection that they started to have uh so then uh the uh, made coalitions with uh, social movement organizations in other places. Uh, I had this massive demonstration in Bologna, for instance, and that was October 2022. There was 30,000 people in a different city uh, and uh, a demonstration in Naples as well. With uh, And there the main ally was the movement of unemployed workers uh, from Naples because that's a very, very massive thing in the south of Italy and uh, Naples being the largest city in the south of Italy, the sort of the main struggle that they have. Um, and uh, of course, there is the popular shareholding campaign. And this is not just Italy. Uh, and then I guess uh, Sean can also say something about this. Uh, so there's been, uh, we are part of the XGKN International Solidarity Network, Sean and I, uh, as we are part of the UK group. Uh, and then there are groups in uh, France, uh, Spain, Argentina, uh and uh germany austria and uh, switzerland that are active at the minute uh and uh, similarly to the ones in italy they've been organizing events uh to talk about the struggle similar to what we're doing tonight uh but that also is meant to you know make people know about this but also lead to more material solidarity which is basically uh if you're part of an organization that could be interested in having a stake in this project uh, to pass a motion to buy uh, stocks in in these uh, in a cooperative, uh, that means you don't have to pay the money now. You only have to take the money out if the cooperative actually gets kickstarted, uh, and then uh, you can always withdraw the money later down the line. So it's not uh, strictly speaking a donation. Also. Uh, you know they also take donations. Uh, that's a different uh, channel. Uh, and and of course the I think it's really one of the best stories of this struggle is solar panels <laughs> from Germany because that really shows the potential of material international solidarity and uh, some types of uh, renewable energy when inserted in different social relations and that was really a way to break the energy blackmail that uh, in which we live now <laughs> I mean we're all living with fossil fuels as power in our lives uh but there are, there are ways out it's just about building the struggles and the coalitions to bring us out from that yeah 100 percent um i had like an amazing question in my head no it was it was a statement anyone who's listening now anyone watching live or anything like that consider writing a motion to your trade union your tenants union 
wherever you are, whatever kind of organization you're based in to uh, uh, potentially buy stocks, because that's that's all it is right now. You're basically agreeing to potentially buy stocks um, if if the cooperative basically gets kickstarted, like Lorenzo says. So consider writing a motion, consider putting forward a motion. Uh, it's definitely something I'll be bringing to GMTU. Um, but trade unions, especially in the UK, they have a lot of money. They have a lot of money that they don't spend uh so yeah if you're if you're in one of the big ones for sure you gotta you gotta get your branch to uh get get that dough over to him um yeah, yeah. so that's what i wanted to say <laughs> go on sean yeah. well it's worth yeah we we have a model motion um like for for uk um trade unions and i guess like w- one kind of interesting thing about it is that normally um you know workers cooperative is the the kind of general meeting is just of the workers um and in the case of gkn what they've done is they've they've got majority of workers but then they've opened up this kind of segment of of shares for um for like the wider like civil society in europe which it means that there's that's why i was saying earlier that there's, it's a kind of focal point in terms of they've they've got this huge potential of engagement of many different unions in different countries who have who've put put themselves forward bought bought some shares and then that that hopefully will will be a kind of and i think there's a there's going to be a shareholder meeting at some point in the next month or so um and in in the uk i think out of that 700,000 i think we maybe uh donated like 20 or 30,000 and most of that was just me and lorenzo talking to union branches that, that we knew and you know they often have like a they're able to just put a thousand pound in especially if it's it, you know it's not a it's not a it's commitment but there are these two issues there's a strike fund and there's the, the capitalization and obviously you know they're on hunger strike now um because they've not received wages um for so long so the, the strike fund is also so maybe it's possible to 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 suggest kind of two different types of donations um if if people are considering it um but i also just think that the the model itself is quite exciting in terms of like creating this this european network of people who are thinking about just transition and that's kind of that's for me the most exciting part of the struggle in a way is that, that we haven't had anything like this really there's there's like union struggles and there's there's um struggles in these industries like in grangemouth or or in Port Talbot in like heavy industries, but they're not necessarily, you know, taking the next st- the next step of how do we how do we like socialize the production? How do we start producing things that people actually need? And that's like a real it's a real um really unprecedented in Europe. There have been smaller examples and attempts at that. So in the UK in um in the seventies and eighties we had this the Lucas plan, which was a um I, I must have been in the 70s early 80s because um, it was the 40th anniversary a couple of years ago um and and that was a plan of people working trade union shop stewards and and workers in a, a number of different arms factories that were run by um by lucas um corporation um and they were making you know planes and tanks and things like that Um, and they wanted to start building trams and windmills and these sorts of things and they were kind of talking with uh, the British state with the um with the Ministry for Technology and um I forget his name the MP with the pipe um oh uh, (laughs) not um oh Jesus yeah sorry took me a second there um, yeah, and, and talking with him about about that project, but they they never, you know, they didn't they didn't manage to actualize that. Um, and this is this is why GKN it's like it's still it's a big factory, and um, but it's it's taking that next step and it's doing it without kind of any um, state state mechanisms um, because they just aren't there in Italy at the moment. Kind of there's no no political will, um, and there are smaller examples um, like. Like in in Greece, there's a factory called um, Viome, which um, was which was very similar story to this, but just you know thirty workers, so so a lot smaller. And they they're a chemicals factory. They took over the factory, they occupied it, and now they produce soaps and 
more ecological cleaning products and, and stuff like that, which is what the community suggested. And you can see the transition in the same way to, to from, you know, something destructive like chemical production into something kind of sustainable, but still relevant for the community and relevant for the workers. So, yeah, so we should support something this large in answer to your question and write a model motion. <laughs> Yeah, it's yeah, it's incredibly important. Um, so we're going to move on to the audience question uh, segment. Now, I understand that you two are just part of the Solidarity Network. Don't worry about it. If you can't answer the question, it's all good. But I'm certain that these questions you'll be able to answer because they're quite sort of like just that. I, I don't think we've got anything out of the ordinary basically. Um, so do any of my co-hosts want to ask the first yeah. question? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Wintry Mute has asked, what would the best way be to empower similar factory takeovers internationally? And um, she's also asked a, a second a question that I'm going to kind of chain on here because I think it's kind of the other side of this question, right? So what would be the best way to empower similar factory takeovers internationally? But also, were the workers in Firenze uniquely positioned to seize the factory in the manner they have? Okay, I'll give it a try. Um, so, uh, in terms of uh, inspiring or uh, making possible uh, similar factory takeovers, well, one thing is that uh, uh, if uh, we are able to contribute to make this struggle successful in Florence, that that would be, you know, an example and inspiration in concrete ways uh, to workers elsewhere in the world. Uh, you know because for example argentinian workers have done it and they have won in many places and that was one of the inspirations for the CKM workers themselves to do it uh so so i think you know the ex CKM workers have already made history certainly in italy it's been the most important labor dispute of the last years in italy but at this stage it could either be another epic working class defeat in which it was worth to struggle anyway because it was the right thing to do, say, like the miners' strikes in the UK. And, uh, you know, and, and you win your pride and you have made history and uh, you set a different balance of power compared to not doing it. Uh, but it could also, you know, become an actual factory that's making cargo bikes and solar panels. And that would be a very practical example for workers that wanted to do it elsewhere. Uh, and in terms of whether they were... Um, particularly uh, like in a strategic position. Uh, uh, I think objectively, they were in a better position than many other workplaces, say, you know, if you're working in the service sector, it's much more difficult to occupy your workplace and uh, have bargaining power because you normally don't have much expensive machinery <laughs> that you can keep there. Uh, but on the other hand, there's been many other similar factories in Europe and elsewhere that have been closed uh, without that type of resistance. So that's where the subjective element comes in. Uh, so it's uh, really a history of, uh, um, say, Florence uh, has a long left-wing tradition. So as Dario was saying, it is the workplace organization, but also the relationship between the workplace and the territory. Uh, so for instance, uh, I'm speaking from Treviso, which is my hometown, uh, and uh, it's known for being a much more conservative place as a whole. So obviously, it would be more difficult here to do that. Uh, but uh, so so it's uh, really the accumulation of organization and solidarity uh, that they have contributed to building. But that's you know part of the subjective story. So there would be other places in which you can do that. And you know, also in Treviso, we're in a better place now than we used to be 20 years ago. So there's hope even for us, imagine in other places. In Italy, there, there's this um, Macora law, which is essentially a law that allows um, for worker co-op takeovers. And that, that's oh. a law that was brought in basically by the the... the um the communists in the 80s and in and that was a kind of war battle that was won kind of politically and that is it basically just allows like a kind of tax benefit if if they i think it's if they like they can capitalize their um 
their unemployment benefit in order to take over the factory. So in terms of like what they're trying to get financially, they're trying to get a whole bunch of popular shareholding. They're trying to use their unemployment benefits, which they'll enact under this Macora law, which will be, you know, a couple of million euros. And then they're trying to get money from um, the established cooperative movement and then from like large investors like the state bank or, um, you know, a, a large scale bank. Um, so they are they have got some kind of benefits, but the thing that's like against them is obviously like if they want to buy a factory that takes like literally more than five minutes to cycle around, um, if they want to buy a piece of land that big with all of those machines, um, it's going to cost them a lot of money, like more than more than twenty million euros or something like that. So, um, so they have got some benefits, but but in terms of like is can people do that elsewhere? I think it's a, a question of like, are people organized and, and can they think of how they can use their leverage? Like, you know, we're seeing in the UK, universities are sacking whole departments and because because they've overhired or not because they've overhired, but because they've generated this industry around um, foreign students coming to, to the UK and, and making loads of money out of them. But because of, you know, people being um uninspired and and a lack of this kind of militancy around work cop takeovers people aren't thinking let's just occupy our departments the staff and continue teaching students and doing research and all of these sorts of things and it's like obviously they're in a different situation but i think like it's it seems mad in a way to say we're just going to take over this this automotive factory and then like stay in it for three years and try and build completely other things but like mm. they're doing it so it's really yeah. like <laughs> where, it, where there's a will there's a way sort of thing yeah, yeah. that's cool that also um partially uh kind of goes into our next question that we had from um from b rat in the chat who asked in terms of legal protection and structure, are co-ops in Italy different from other shareholder-owned companies? I'm asking because I've seen them fail in Slovenia because there's no way to enforce a co-op, staying a co-op over a long time here. So, um, yeah, what do you think of that? Well, I'm not an expert on uh, the laws on co-ops, uh, but uh, it's kind of perverse that's way the way it's been working out in Italy so you had this uh, you know cooperative movement that started from uh, early socialism in Italy and then uh, became more established uh, so they managed to uh, get some uh, benefits so some uh, uh, type of taxes and rules that apply to private companies do not apply to co-ops which make makes co-ops more viable in some ways but then what happened because you know capital has a tendency to subsume is that uh, then uh, especially in the logistics sector you have the main companies so they are the big um, delivery companies like uh, american express uh, they outsource uh, their uh, labor power to bogus cooperatives that have become the most common type of cooperative in italy and then if you are uh, working for those cooperatives you're not an employee you are a, a member and associate of the cooperative and then you can be fired not with the usual procedures but they can suspend your association to the cooperative for instance and therefore you have uh, this uh, massive sector of uh, bogus cooperatives with mostly migrant racialized workers that are super exploited compared to uh, the core workforce that is directly hired and that's mean the main the main basis for uh, the strike wave in the logistics sector that's been happening in Italy in the last ten years. Uh, and uh, I've been to demos in which the slogan was "The cooperatives are thieves" <laughs> because <laughs> of the basically bad name that uh, they have made for themselves in this bogus way. So basically, what the GKN collective is doing is also uh, recovering the original meaning of the cooperative that has been somewhat lost in Italy recently. Yeah, like if you go in, in Bologna, you can see well, I've seen like graffiti that's like co-op with like a skull on top of it. So it's like it, it really is like it's a it's a it's a legal model, basically. And 
you know, it, pe people can use it and they can, you know, bosses can use it in a way where they can set up a company, they can make people members of the co-op, they can give them no real democracy. Um, and that's why, you know, there's there's like the legal form of a co-op and then there's what actually goes on. And if you have this kind of permanent workers assembly like they have in GKN or you have a flat horizontal structure that actually is empowering for workers, um, then then you can do, you can like plan and you can do good things, but you can also use that model um, just for, you know, it's corporate benefits or, or, or you can see it. Um, you know, you you can see it dissolve, but but it is it is different in each national context. And like some countries, it's like really straightforward, and other countries, like say in France, it's really confusing. Like there's like two legal forms, and neither of them really make sense. Whereas in like Spain, it's really straightforward. Italy, it's more straightforward. But like you know, in Slovenia, you know, it's probably it's probably I don't think I think I've. Yeah, I don't think it's as established, but I think, you know, it's something that you would just need to work with with people in in your <clears throat> in your solidarity organizations as much as in your um as in your established co-op movement because <laughs> you know, they're they're very different sides of a coin sometimes. Great. I can't believe cooperatives have been co-opted. That's bullshit. Um so, uh the next question is from Vordrella Bordrella asks, is there any education towards the general public about what has changed and why? If so, what is the response there? And do you know good methods to present these changes to the masses? Um, well, yeah, uh, one of the main things has been, they've been very good in communication. Uh, so since the beginning, they had their own sort of uh, visual identity. So Dario and I were wearing these cool T-shirts that you can buy as well. Uh, and that became very recognizable uh, so that people across Italy that are politically aware uh, know straight away what that is. Uh, uh, but on, on the local level, there's been these weekly uh, meetings open to the public that have been very effective, as I was saying, bringing many people to the factory. Uh, and they have uh, this um, working class literature uh, yearly event uh, that's been there's been 5,000 people uh, the last time in April I was there as well I was very inspiring as well uh, as Dario said in uh, another webinar recently uh, there's been this violent uh, attack well I mean in terms of words by management uh saying that uh oh, you are complaining about you're not receiving wages but uh now you are talking about poetry so what's the problem is because basically the ruling class doesn't want workers to have uh, the bread and the roses basically and <laughs> considers it as a scandal uh while, while you know bringing that type of uh narrative in a way that you know since the 90s have been sort of um in the Italian social science idea that uh, class is an old fashioned way of looking at society. So recovering that sort of narrative has been also, I think, very effective. And then they've been very active on all kinds of social media to then with this visual identity, this uh, local base, and uh, this way of uh, building connection with all the new working class literature uh, in Italy and abroad. I, I think, you know, that's been a way to reach out to the masses. Yeah. I also, as well as t-shirts, they make um, Sambuca and uh, and Amaro, I think. Um, so, and it's called like Partigiano, Partigiano Amaro and the Sambuca has got the GKN, GKN logo on it. So <laughs> if anyone, if anyone does go um, down to Italy for the big protest in July, make sure you've got some space in your bags to, to carry back some some alcohol on the, on the train or or whatever um yeah <laughs> Damn, so if, if if only it wasn't the two kinds of liquor that i just really can't stand uh, <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> they do like jam and stuff as well <laughs> yeah that's what jam. solidarity is mule you just gotta <laughs> chug it back anyway <laughs> you gotta enjoy it and tell your friends to get some too that's true <laughs> okay great uh, who yeah, wants to do the next one? Tim, did sure. you want to? Or Sophie? Um, yeah. 
I'll do it. Yeah. Uh, when yeah. to mute again? Asking how did FIOM GCL build power in the Forensic Factory prior to the takeover? Yeah, this one is a hard one to be honest. I don't know much about the history prior to 2021. Uh, the thing uh, I can say is that um, GKN used to be a part of Fiat. Uh, so Fiat, uh, as you might know, is the largest uh, Italian automotive company that now is part of this big international conglomerate that is uh, Stellantis. Uh, so the Fiat workers were uh, among the most militant in Italy's uh, second bread uh, two years of 68 and 69. Uh, and the Metal Workers Federation within CGIL is the one that is more to the left. Uh, and that's largely due to this long tradition that comes from the 60s. And uh, therefore, uh, when uh, you go to protest at GKN, you always... Uh, hear him talk as well about uh, the legacy of the struggles of the 60s and 70s for uh, the rights that workers still have despite uh, the different ways of neoliberal attacks. Uh, so they've been able to build on this decade-long tradition that that would be my answer. And if anyone wants to know more about that struggle, they should read Nanny Balestrini's We Want Everything because it's a, an amazing book. Uh, final question. Uh, Tim, do you want to do this one? Yeah. Uh, Michaela Raphael asks, question for panelists. For those watching the stream, what's one high effort and one low effort contribution that we could make to support the GKN, uh, yeah, the GKN workers, I think they mean, uh, the and the larger solidarity movement? So yeah, what's something they could do that is super easy and something that they could do that maybe takes a little bit more of um, a commitment. You got any uh, ideas? Yeah, well, I mean, super easy is uh, we've put in the chat on the YouTube uh, links to the UK fundraiser and uh, you can even donate just 10 pounds or, you know, whatever you feel like. Uh, you can donate and that literally takes two minutes. Uh, I guess intermediate commitment is uh, propose a motion to an organization that you're part of, that you're active in, to uh, participate in the cooperative. And high commitment is uh, join the UK international group if you're in the UK or uh, whatever national group uh, is that in your country. I don't know about New Zealand, but maybe. You can establish one if you want a very high commitment. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. That's the high commitment one, yeah. Uh, and another high commitment is uh, uh, we're organizing for people uh, to come to the protest in July from abroad uh, as soon as it is confirmed, because we're not sure yet about what will happen in the next few weeks. Uh, I don't know whether Sean has more to add. Yeah, yeah, I think I think this like I think visiting is is great because it's been really useful to have like um you know spokespeople in in countries who have like been there and who have contacts and you know it's also just good for people on the left in the UK or in other countries to learn about left traditions in other countries and there's like a lot of richness that comes with going and visiting like an occupation for a couple of days you'll meet people and you'll learn learn stories and there was you know when i went to visit um there's actually a, another a, like a logistics depot very close to the gkm factory which is like a large very kind of like ikea or something like a large clothing um logistics delivery hub and they were on strike at the same time as gkn and they were kind of like vibing off each other and um you know you could they you could see the banners from from each of the two places and stuff like that that obviously it only come around because of the fact that the GKM was there. So, so there was like this, this inspirational struggle and then they were enabled like a really hardcore strike um, very close by. And just opposite, there's like a, opposite the gates, there's like a shopping center um, and a kind of multi-story car park. And in on the multi-story car park, there's a banner that's been hung there since like the beginning, you know, three years ago that says like solidarity with GKM. And that was just put up by the workers in the shopping centre and the shopping centre haven't sort of dared to take it down because they know that the support is there. So there's things like that, which, you know, are really 
you know really nice and uh, obviously the food's great so it's, it's a nice place to to visit um if you're looking for a, for a holidarity in in july holidarity i love it um well that brings us to the end of the audience question segment and therefore the end of our guest segment uh lorenzo and sean thanks so much for joining us uh we normally ask our guests for homework to give to our chatters but i think the question there at the end about the high commitment and the low commitment action that you could do i would say that you'd probably ask people to do that for homework <laughs> um unless you've got any ideas i don't know it's oh, up yeah. to you just one thing i wanted to say uh it's not homework really but uh it's to say that the uk collective has always been very clear and outspoken about the ongoing genocide in palestine and they support the struggle and it's been you know uh new year's eve speech by dario about the relatives and absolutes so Relatively, the Ukraine struggle is very small compared to what's happening in Palestine, but it's having that sort of power in our context uh, that allows us to then struggle in solidarity with Palestine today. Uh, so I just wanted to make that clear before uh, saying goodbye and thanks very much for having us. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Lorenzo. Thank you so much, Sean. Yeah, um you. Are, the, are there any other uh, sort of links or bits and pieces that you want to plug before we uh, say goodbye? I think the main links are in the chat. Uh, I don't know whether Sean has... Yep, so insogiamo.org and the GoFundMe, which we'll try to put in the uh, descriptions of anywhere this is posted. Cool. Yeah, and there's a, there's a good movie by Real News, or not a movie, but like a kind of informational clip if people want to see more of like the actual factory so just have a look on youtube for for the for that if you want more like context to, to see oh is actual... that the one that's about like eight minutes long or so yeah 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 yeah, yeah. that one's really good yeah uh cool. check that out chat it's, it's a very low effort thing you can do to <laughs> to find <laughs> out uh, a little bit more about what's going on cool uh yeah awesome thanks so thanks, much uh, thanks both of you for coming along solidarity see you later so nice to you guys. See ya. See ya. Well, uh, that was absolutely incredible. Yep. What a great, once, what a great show. Yep. Once again, you can find the the links for in sogiamo dot org, uh, which is i n s o r g i a m o dot org, and the GoFundMe, which you should be able to find by googling support G K N auto workers just transition struggle. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, but always supporting want... transition struggles here. It's Hell just, yeah, uh, I, that's yeah. fucking I right. Um, Solidarity. But, but if you want to support the show, it's worth reminding everyone uh, that oh, how do we do a little low effort rem reminder about the Patreon? We're doing a we're doing a <laughs> cheeky lazy one today. So there is a Patreon. It's patreoncom slash red underscore planet. There's various tiers there, but you can go yeah. read them for yourself. Yeah, we're, yeah, yeah, we're being lazy, and now you have to not be lazy. Go read yourself. We're <laughs> you'll always telling you all the you'll do it. But the highest you. tier uh, does include the reward that you get thanked on every single show, including this lazy show where we're <gasps> being lazy about the plug. Uh, oh my god! So thank you to our sickos who are JBP, Queen Pib, Cassie, Tastrophe, and Risk Inverse. Thank you for supporting the show. Sickos, the possible tier. <laughs> uh, but if you wanted to support Mule at the highest possible tier, how would you do that? Oh, Sophie, you would do that by going to patreon.com forward slash DJ M-U-E-L. Uh, I got a new movie review coming out. Uh, everybody's watching Fallout, talking about the Fallout TV show, or maybe I'm late to that. I don't know. Everybody's already watched it. The hype's gone. Uh, but I decided to watch uh, a movie that inspired Fallout. And no, it's not Mad Max. How are you going to find out what it is? Well, you'll have to go to my Patreon and subscribe uh, at least uh, the tier that lets you watch my bonus content, which I think is £5, <laughs> and find out. Uh, so you could go there. You could give me money. Uh, I don't do streams anymore. I don't know if I I don't know if I fucking mentioned this on Red Planet. I don't really do political streams anymore. So 
You could go to my Twitch if you want. I'm planning on doing like a uh, little gaming stuff. Uh, there's a game called Black and White that I'm going to play uh, mm. uh, on stream this week. It's it's like an old ass Peter Molyneux God game. Yeah, I uh, remember that. That was huge when it came out. Oh, yeah. dude, I was playing it last week and oh man it was like going back in time like <laughs> oh real like patient gamer shit uh so yeah you, if you want to check me out doing that that's gonna be twitch.tv forward slash dj m-u-e-l uh and i got a new video coming out soon it's in the works i'm not gonna tell you what it's about because that'll fuck me up with my adhd uh but if you want to find out what that is you can go to the patreon or you could go to my youtube channel which is youtube.com forward slash c forward slash dj m-u-e-l go to linktree.ee forward slash dj m-u-e-l uh to find all my links but what about tim um yeah you can find me on youtube as conquest of dread you can find me on same same on tw uh twitch although i don't really uh haven't really streamed on there for a long time uh, or you can find me on blue sky and twitter as dread conquest um yeah at the moment i'm i'm i've been working on a tabletop role-playing game for a long time it's getting very close to coming out so also check out uh dark rpg 2000 on twitter uh, if you want, if you're into that kind of thing, if you if you love that kind of stuff, check it out. Um, but what about so? Uh, what about me? Oh, I wanted to say the Dark RPG is a, a very beautiful game, and you should definitely check it out. Big, big, <laughs> Thank big you. shout out there; it's, it rules. Um, but yeah, uh, if you want to support me, uh, then please do uh, follow follow that <laughs> impulse and support me because um, at the moment my friends are helping me to afford groceries and my HRT um uh i'm gonna be returning from hiatus and releasing content again soon um i will be bapping out a bunch of videos in a row uh i have some stuff up on my patreon written already one about technology and teleology there's one about um uh bushnell and uh martyrdom uh, I'm working on something at the moment that's called the mad and the mentally ill against the diagnostic model and is a really uh i i think it's it's coming out quite well and is a um a, a, a good look at um the liberal identity class of the mentally ill and the foucauldian social class of the mad and where the diagnostic model fucks up everyone whose brains are a little bit spicy um, so as well hyped. as everyone in general um, so hyped. as well as that i'm working on something about misinformation and the internet and all of those will be up on my channel uh, in the next couple of months when I start releasing content again. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to get, being back. But in the meantime, my income, uh, uh, you know, isn't, isn't, isn't going up until I get that content out. So if you want to support me, linktree slash Sophie from Mars, all one word, is where you can do it. You can either go to my Patreon and you can see all that stuff I just described early when it's up, or you can just send me money directly if you have some spare cash that you want to send to a financially struggling trans woman um yep that's what i recommend you do with the rest of your day <laughs> but and don't uh, forget I also oh, want to remind everyone that there is a fourth host of red planet you know, i'm on it i'm doing it i'm doing it right where now. is she where's uh, she gone she's, she's somewhere right now uh and she's having a time of it as well so if you want to support kira our fourth host linktree slash kira chats is where you can go to do it i nailed it i nailed it Nailed you it, did so it. good. Right. Next week, we're doing a discussion episode about uh, situationist theory. So that'll be fascinating. <laughs> Please tune in. I promise it's more interesting than it sounds. You're going to really like it. Okay. Bye. <laughs> See you later. Bye. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs>